Wait, I think most people are back from lunch. So, uh, are you ready to be introduced, Alexei? Yep. Okay. Well, you're, it's not going to be much of an introduction. But, um, yeah, we're very grateful to uh, Professor Alexei Pokudin for agreeing to give, give these next two lectures uh, on the phenomena, phenomenology of TMDs. I think he learned two days ago he was giving these lectures. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, Professor uh, Burkhart was unable to stay to deliver his lectures, and um, although we will try to get his slides on GPDs and orbital angular momentum, we we'll post them on our Slack page uh, once we are able to obtain them. Um, but yeah, Alexei is uh, yeah, one of the PIs of our TMD collaboration. Um, he is. Uh, He's, he, he, is the, he is the world's expert on the phenomenology of TMDs. And um, uh, he wrote a masterpiece, uh, primary, primary author of the masterpiece, which is chapter five, the TMD handbook. And uh, um, yeah, we knew when we, we need to think of a, a backup, like a substitute lecture. Um, yeah, I could think of no better person than, than to like, ask Alexei to tell you about you know, the subject. So, yeah. Uh, professor at Penn State Berks uh, and an internally prepared teacher. <laughs> so, um, he's posted, you can, I'm sure he'll explain to you, he's posted some uh, GitHub link in the uh, Slack pages where you can access some of the files he's going to use uh, during his lecture. And I guess you have some hands on Mathematica notebooks for them too. So. Yep. Later, later today. Thank you, Chris. It's 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 a great pleasure and an honor to to, to be here today with you. And uh, um, it's it's a it's a great a great pleasure for me to to fill in for 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 Matthias Burkert. Of course, uh, by no means I can give um, as beautiful lectures as uh, Matthias could. Um, and um, I'll be talking about uh, phenology of Tim Dees, uh, uh, loosely based of uh, our chapter number five um, in the Tim D handbook. So let me start from telling you about the plan. So I'll give two lectures today. And so lecture number one will be generically about the structure of the nucleon. I'll introduce transfer momentum dependent distributions to you, I think for the fifth time or so in this um, school. Uh, lecture number two will be dedicated to some peculiarities of our studies about semi-inclusive diplomatic scattering. And in particular, I'll do some hands-on session using Mathematica on calculations of CD structure functions using Mathematica. So you'll find all material in this GitHub repository, including my lectures and notebooks. So there are free exercises for you, so nothing comes um, for free. So um, choose any file in the GitHub repository, uh, severs.nb or collins.nb, follow the file, calculate the structure functions and plot the symmetries. Compare your results to plots from example.notebook. Okay, so that's the easiest one. So I think it's fairly easy for everybody to do that. Uh, a more difficult two-star exercise, use definitions of Fourier transform of TMDs from TMD handbook equation 2.192, 2.193, and show that they give the same results as one obtained in the previous exercise. So in the previous exercise, I'll use a very simple approximation, part of model approximation to TMDs with Gaussian dependence on the part on uh, transfer momentum. Therefore, everything is analytic. Uh, all results should be Gaussian, of course, but I'd like you also to do the Fourier transform of those results and show that formulas give the same results as well. And uh, a more difficult exercise, in case you like the previous two, we write the notebook using Python. In particular, use symbolic Python SymPy to perform analytic computations. Anybody who manages to do all three exercises, is welcome to reach to me and we can start a research project with you okay so i'll uh, during my hands-on sessions i'll talk uh, i'll show you mathematics so i'll, I'll show uh, how it works and show some examples from 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 there uh, how i'll structure the lectures um, let's do the following i'll 
split the lectures half half each one so that you will talk probably for 40 minutes or so then we'll have five minute break and uh, go by the rest of the time for 40 minutes or so. So we'll cover one hour and a half. Then we'll have um, 30 minutes uh, coffee break, I believe, in between of the lectures. This will allow me to help clean uh, the birthday party um, of my son, who's happening outside in the cold. And then we'll go with lecture number two. Uh, feel free to stop me anytime asking questions so um, i can barely see you there um, i hope i i wish i could be there you know to i i can i can see you okay is it a question chris <laughs> no but i can see you so if, if there is any question just let, let, let me know so that i don't uh, then let's go so let me start, you know, from, from the beginning, what, 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 what do we study? Of course, we would like to understand the structure of protons and neutrons, and nucleons. And uh, if we start for, from very simplistic um, quark model, then of course we know that the proton is composed out of two up quarks and one down quark. The neutron is composed out uh, of two down and one up quarks. So everything um, checks, so we know that quark charges are fractional of positron charge. So the, the charge of the up quark is plus two thirds. The charge of the positron of the down quark is minus one third. So if you do this simple result, we see that it's just plus one. It should be for the proton. Uh, for the neutron, um, again, it's zero charge. So it works. So we have no evidence of free quarks observed directly in experiment works hadronized in, uh, into the um, uh, color-free uh, hadrons. And uh, at long distance quarks are confined in hadrons and at short distance quark behave as if they were free. And that's a very famous asymptotic freedom. Later in this lecture, we'll talk a little bit more about that. This actually allows us to use uh, scattering as the prop of the structure of the nuclear. So as we will talk more about the uh, interaction of leptons and, and, and nucleons, and of course um, we need to touch upon quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics. What are the differences? What are the similarities? It's uh, QD is a gauge theory it's, uh, with the gauge group U1. It means that there is one force carrier, which is the photon, it's electrically neutral. So would interact with electron or positron in, in our theory interaction. It can be characterized by this diagram here, which is the famous Feynman diagram. And the strength of the interaction is characterized by the electromagnetic, which is approximately one over 137. And, and of course, Richard Feynman received Nobel Prize in 1965 for fundamental work in quantum electrodynamics. The theory that describes um, quarks and gluons that compose uh, the nucleon is quantum chromodynamics. It's the gauge theory with another gauge group, SU3, means that there are more force carriers. Those are gluons. They carry additional quantum number, which we call color. And it's, um, gluons can interact with quarks, anti-quarks. And here's the diagram of interaction of the balloon with the quark. And again, the strength of the interaction at some particular scale will be, say, around 0 0.1. And ten, it tells us immediately that it's uh, stronger than uh, ele electromagnetic interaction. That's why it's the strong interaction. And apart from this sort of diagrams, we have also interaction between the gluons, the triple and quadruple interactions like that. So gluons interact, they carry they carry color as well, so they can interact. So it tells us that the theory that we talk about is a non abelian theory. And of course, there are consequences. Uh, the coupling uh, in gauge theories depend on, on the scale, which is the consequence of renormalizability of the theory. For QCD in particular, at short distances, quite counterintuitively, quark behave as if they were almost three particles. Here are the alpha s shown as the function of q and q is 
related to the distances. So short distances correspond to larger values of Q, long distances to lower values of Q. So the coupling becomes smaller and smaller. That's the phenomenon of the asymptotic freedom. And for the discovery of asymptotic freedom in QCD, Gross, Politzer, and Wilczek received Nobel Prize in 2004. So how do we study the structure? Historically, uh, the structure of the, uh, of the matter uh, was studied uh, via interactions and maybe you know, it all started with uh, experiments by Ernest Rutherford, who got Nobel Prize in 1908 for his investigation of the disintegration of the elements in the chemistry of radioactive substances, but his famous experiment is very important for us. There he used um, a source of alpha particles and then this collimated beam of alpha particles was sent against um, very thin gold foil and there was a luminescent screen. And by studying uh, the scattering of alpha particles of the gold foil, he was able to determine that inside of the of, of the atom there were very heavy cores, which now we call nuclei of the of the atoms of gold. So this experiment was done in 1911. So that's the origin of our studies. So now, in order to study the structure of the nucleon, and in this particular lecture, let me let me concentrate on the electron scattering, which is very important for many experimental facilities. In particular, it's important for Jeff's lab and the future electron ion collider. So what we do is that we scatter electrons, electron beams of, of, of our target or target beam that contains nucleons. Interaction happens uh, by exchange of the virtual photon. And Q square here is the uh, virtuality of the exchanged photon. The photon probes transfers distance of order of one over Q inside of the proton. So the higher the Q, the shorter distances we can probe. And the asymptotic freedom allows us to, 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 to understand that the scattering is happening of, of, of a quark of some constituents inside of the, of, the, of the nucleon. And of course, once we knock out the quark from or apart from the, from, from, from the nucleon, and those partners hadronize, and so we have detectors of hadrons in order to see what's happening in this particular scattering. So in order to give interpretation to, to, to those measurements, of course, um, we, need to, we need to interpret this sort of diagrams. For instance, there is the diagram of scattering of a lepton of, of the proton. And uh, in, in this particular diagram, I depict that the proton is disintegrated in many final states. So the electromagnetic probe resolves a part on quark or anti-quark with some momentum P, let me call it P, which is fraction X of the momentum of, of the proton itself inside of the proton, or inside of the proton. Now, kinematically one can uh, define the so-called Björkin variable, X Björkin, which is the ratio of Q square, the absolute value of the virtuality of the photon over two PQ, there PQ is the energy of the system, uh, photon and the proton. And um, it's important to realize that this is a kinematical variable. And this kinematical variable in this particular uh, scattering turns out to be equal to, to the fraction of the momentum carried by, by the pro by, by, by the pattern itself. So that's, uh, that allows us to actually tag on a particular pattern with some particular fraction. Now then we uh, then then we get experimental measurements. So that's that's the reduced cross section of of deep analysis scattering as a function of Q square. If we look on how this cross section behaves with the uh, with the scale with the distance or the virtuality Q square, we see that, for instance, for 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 this particular value of x 0.18, behavior is almost flat. So we can deduce from, 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 from 
just this picture here that uh, quarks look like point-like particles because we resolve more and more distance, but we don't see any sort of deviation in this behavior. We do see some deviation, but this deviation turns out to be taken into account by de Glock evolution equations, not by the structure of the quarks or anti quarks themselves. And of course, unlike the, the, the protons, because if you were to do the elastic scattering of, of electrons of, of the proton, then it would measure the elastic form factor and the elastic form factor doesn't have the straight line behavior. It has a uh, falling behavior like that from which we can figure out what's the, what's the size of the particle we are scattering our, our, um, our electrons of and this proton size, you know, it's around one fermi, it's quite a large particle. So the study of the nucleon, of course, is a fundamental question. My next few slides are just a motivation of what we would like to do. Well, when we study the structure of the nucleon, we understand the structure of the of the matter we all are made of. And we understand so the uh, Tails of the strong force, QCD. And um, last but not least, we use uh, protons as tools for discovery, for instance, at uh, the Large Hadron Collider. So before we claim any discovery, we need to make sure that we understand the structure of those particles very well. And uh, it's very important, of course, to realize that uh, protons have uh, quantum numbers have particle properties. One of them is spin and uh, why spin is important. So I'll, I'll be talking in my next lecture about, about semi-inclusive elastic scattering and I'll tell you about the structure functions and different functions that you can study, but um, generically why, why, why spin is important. And in order to emphasize that, I, I usually use this slide here, which I stole from Shandong Ji, who used it in his plenary talk at Deep Analysis Scattering 2008. He'll be giving lectures later next week to you guys. And um, he emphasizes that spin is a fundamental quantum degree of freedom, and it plays a um, crucial role in determining the basic structure of fundamental interactions. So that it means that the test of the theory is never complete without the full test of spin dependent decays and scatterings. And therefore, it's very important to keep track of the spin. What's important for us uh, in terms of the um, physics of, of the structure, spin provides a unique opportunity to probe the inner structure of composite system, such as the proton. And I'll tell you why and what's, what we are going to study. If, if that's not enough, let me use a couple of um, motivational quotes. One will be from Elliot Leder, who wrote in 2001 that experiments with spin have killed more theories than any other single physical parameter. And so uh, even before that, uh, uh, Bjorken, uh, J.D. Bjorken, uh, mentioned in 1987 that polarization data has often been the graveyard of fashionable theories. If theorists had their way, they might well ban such measurements altogether out of self-protection. And of course, uh, we have no fear of, uh, of spin, so we'll just plunge into this um, very treacherous ground, as you see. So we will study the structure of the nucleon, so the nucleon landscape. So what, 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 what's that? So what, let, let us try to first uh, think uh, what is the um, what, 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 what do we study? So we study the nucleon and as, as you see already of course we all know that the nucleon is, is a very is a dynamical system of quarks and gluons. The number of quarks and gluons is, um, is constantly changing therefore it has very complicated dynamics. So then we change X, X Birkin, at which we probe uh, the nucleon wave function, for instance. We probe different aspects of this nucleon wave function. Here in this plot, it's the 
uh, Birkin variable x versus q squared, just theoretical coverage. And it's, uh, as an example, it's the electron eye collider for different energies and Jefferson lab 12. So it covers different regions in q squared, different regions in x. And so if we start from larger values of x in Birkin, we, uh, oops, sorry, where am I? There you go. Then uh, we are going to prop the uh, so-called valence regime where mostly free quarks, that's the same free quarks that we were seeing in the quark model before, play the important role in the nuclear wave function. Now then we uh, increase the energy or decrease the value of X, we would see the emergence of the um, C quarks and gluons. Uh, more particles will be important in the nuclear wave function. And then we go, say, to the extreme values of energy, to the lowest values of X, then uh, the splitting of the gluons would produce a lot of gluons. And so that our particle now will be dominated, the wave function will be dominated by, by the gluons. So we will probably reach to the regime where the saturation will play a role. And again, we'll have lectures about the so-called small X, I think, next week. We would also like to understand how patterns move and where they are distributed in space. And this is one of the directions of development of nuclear physics. And technically, such information is encoded into two different types of distributions. One is called the generalized pattern distributions, GPDs, that tells us how quarks are distributed in space, actually, with respect, say, to the center of mass of the nucleon. Or if we want to see how quarks are moving inside of the nucleon, then we'll be using transverse momentum dependent distribution functions. And that's the main theme of this school here. So these distributions are called, uh, are referred to as 3D, three dimensional distributions, as they give us aspects, not only on the collinear motion of quarks and gluons, but also on the, uh, on how they distributed in space or in the momentum space. Um, around 20 years ago, or probably a little bit more, um, it was understood that in principle, we could even speak about uh, the um, Wigner type of uh, phase distributions there. Uh, those distributions would encode the collinear momentum X, that's the fraction of the, uh, of the photon momentum carried by, by the quarks, but also information about motion of quarks and position of quarks. So these are Wigner distributions, uh, so one plus two plus two, five dimensional distribution. Um, in this 20 years, there were a few attempts to understand how to study Wigner distributions in experiments, and there are actually very nice proposals but uh, it turns out it's quite difficult to study Wigner distributions directly. Nevertheless, if one, say, um, integrates out the position of quarks from Wigner distribution, then uh, the distribution is reduced to the three-dimensional. So it encodes only collinear momentum X and transverse momentum KT, which is the transverse momentum dependent distributions. That's the distributions that you heard about um, a lot of times about this school. If we integrate out information about the transit motion of partons inside of the nucleon from this distribution, then we can reduce the Wigner distribution to the generalized parton distributions, GPDs. Now they will also depend on three variables and those variables are called X, uh, Xi and T. Xi is skewness, T is the transit momentum, X is the collinear momentum. We can go more in reduction. So if we integrate from trans momentum dependent distributions, information about trans motion, then we will produce information from these 3D distributions to just collinear part on distributions. I believe um, uh, Ian Stewart in his um, lectures actually showed you some examples of, of, of how this can work actually in practice. And I guess there was a lecture also given by one of the students of this school. Uh, in terms of GPDs, if we integrate information about the collinear momentum X, then we will reduce those to form factors. So you see, it's interesting that all, all those things are 
related quite a bit to each other. So now, of course, there are a lot of uh, peculiarities of how this can be done because we are talking about the distributions that obey renormalization conditions and so on. So forth. Now, if we talk more about the nuclear landscape, uh, we can talk about um, evolution. Evolution is, of course, very important. So I told you that a virtual photon serves as the macroscopic prop of the transverse distance. Okay, so let's let's fix now Q square. So this uh, scale here is the logarithm of Q square, and this will be the rapidity scale logarithm of one over X or energy, if you like. So now let's fix energy, but then fix also Q square. Uh, then uh, the quarks and and anti quarks that we resolve inside of the of the of the of the, of the nucleon will have some particular size because of the size of the resolution scale of the photon. Now, if we go to the larger values of Q square, the resolution um, transverse uh, distance will reduce, and so we will see more particles popping in inside. And how this happens is described by the so-called Diglop evolution equations. So now energy is fixed, but Q square is increasing. So in this direction is described by Diglop evolution. On the other hand, if, if one fixes Q square, but increases the energy, by increasing the energy again, we give a possibility for the um, for for patterns to radiate. But now they radiate patterns of the same size. And the patterns will start populating the, uh, the, the, the size of one for Fermi size of the, of the nucleon. At some point, we will come to the situation the patterns will start overlapping each other. And that's the regime where we expect to have saturation. Because now, at that point, recombination effects will be important. And so that's why saturation will, will, will play an important role. Uh, this is not yet uh, discovered. Uh, however, there are hopes that we will be able to discover it maybe at the electron ion collider or at the LHC maybe. And you'll have lectures about that next week. So the dynamics in this direction uh, is described by this called BFKL equation or BK or Jim Volk evolution equation. And this is the difference between the dilute or dense regime of you see. So as such, now in order to study um, the nucleon, we will employ factorization theorems. So we'll disentangle the dynamics of the prop from the dynamics of the of, of the nucleon that study. And factorization theorems, um, in fact, uh, nothing else is the um, controllable approximations that allow us to, to separate those dynamics. So the, they allow us actually to relate functions that describe the hadron structure and experimental observables with some controllable approximation that's very important. And the hadron structure is the ultimate goal, if you like, in measurements and in knowledge. In this plot here, you can see um, actually that's uh, in momentum space how uh, up quarks react to polar polarization of the quarks, so po sorry, polarization of the proton. So polarization of the proton is up, and uh, uh, the distribution of quarks, and distribution of quarks, uh, up quarks are shifted from, say, the center position here to the right. And I'll tell you more why it is so. And this is already coming from the experiment. experiment. So how do we study the structure of the nucleons? I think I'll have 10 minutes, so I'll probably be able to finish my introductory remarks at that time. Um, so let me start from, from, from deep analysis scattering as, exam as an example. So as we already saw this diagram here, let us study particular um, limit of this diagram. So Q square will grow, P dot Q will grow, technically to infinity so that X Bjorken goes to, to a constant. So the cross section is the square of the diagram. So it's diagram multiplied by the conjugate diagram. So it looks like that. Uh, now you can also represent this diagram as, a, as, as the so-called cut diagram, but in order to go from the square to the cut diagram, one needs to have this trick by inserting the sum 
of the final state as such, which is the which is the unity. And in order to do that, one actually needs to have uh, this, this this condition here. So the energy should be big enough so it should produce actually the complete state of states in the final state, so that we, we are able to in introduce this sum in the diagrammatic way. So once we've done this, uh, we will have, instead of just square the diagram, we'll have this diagram, which is cut in half by, by this line here, meaning that we put all particles on the shell there. And the, mo uh, the pardon model is logical step. The pardons are point-like and dilute, so that the photon that can resolve just very um, small distance would interact with one dilute object, not, not many, but just one. And uh, from this diagram now, we get the so-called handbag diagram, which looks like this. So the photon interacts with a particle inside of the nucleon, particle inside of the nucleon has momentum P. Now, then it will propagate and go through the cut like this. So the diagram will look like this. So that's the famous handbag diagram that describes deep mass scattering here. And again, from this diagram here, uh, if you assume this diagram to, do, to dom dominate, we can easily see that point-like particles will produce straight behavior in Q-square, constant behavior in Q-square. So what we did in, in this sort of factorization, once, once we once we refactorized, you know, what happens with our lepton is that we um, introduced say the so-called leptonic tensor so the leptonic tensor is the product of these two factors so the lepton that radiates the photon here and and again the lepton that absorbs the photon here and this would produce the so-called leptonic tensor l mu uh, so this will be new and new sitting there and the rest below here would be encoded in the so-called hadron tensor w mu that's that's the diagram for our hadronic tensor. Now the cross section will be the convolution of leptonic tensor and hadronic tensor. So now we have already done this very important step of disentangling the dynamics of the lepton. So the lepton is completely out of the game here. So now we are talking only about the interaction of the photon with a quark inside of the inside of the nucleon. So this diagram is the handbag diagram. So what uh, this thing here is, uh, this blob here is non-perturbative dynamics of our, of our nucleon. It depends, of course, on two momenta, which we have. It's momentum of the particle P, momentum of the nucleon P, and capital P, and the spin, if you like, also here. And that is the so-called part and correlator. So, now the top line here crosses the crosses the cut, and therefore this particle has to be on has to be on shell. So the imaginary part, which is done by this by this cut here of this propagator, one oops sorry, one over k square plus epsilon is proportional to pi delta k square. So it tells us that this particle is on shell. So k square is approximately equal to, to zero. Of course now quarks inside of the inside of the nucleon are always virtual. So in, in principle, virtuality of this this line here can be any, but as uh, I believe uh, Jean Wei told you, the virtuality of these two lines, this P and P, are pinched. And uh, if we integrate, say, the uh, momentum of the, of the of the quark P. And we have this line, which is one over p squared plus i epsilon. That line, one p squared minus i epsilon, because of this pinching, the main contribution comes from the regime there. P squared is approximately equal to zero, and that's that's why part model actually actually works. So this particle now can travel for a long time before it meets the photon, and then this can also travel for a long time and it can hadronize at some point. So now, as this particle can travel for a long time before it meets the photon, we are also able to 
disentangle this part here completely. And this part downstairs is the um, parton correlator, the so-called parton correlator. And it's, it will be a matrix Fij depending on the direct, direct indices of the quark fields and other quark fields. So I write down here already uh, what it looks like. Uh, and first of all, we have the Fourier transform from coordinate to momentum space. Okay, so what we measure or what the experiment measures is done in the momentum space, but now we define this matrix element here in the position space. In order to go to the momentum space, we need the Fourier transform. So now in this operator here, we have quark field operator, which is that sitting at some position xi. And we have the proton state vector P and xi is the position of the field in coordinate space. This matrix element is famous by a local matrix element. It has two, uh, two quark fields inside and uh, the bilocal matrix elements encodes um, now information about, uh, about the non perturbative structure of the nucleon. They can be studied in models, they can be studied in, say, ab initio calculations such as, such as lattice QCD. And I believe uh, you will have also lectures about lattice QCD, how this studies this bilocal matrix elements. Now, in order to go a little bit more in detail of, 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 of all that, we need to actually classify our momentum. So what helps is, is knowing that one of, the, one of the components of our momentum is large. So suppose that a proton is moving along Z direction with high momentum. So the proton moving, is moving and, 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 and quarks, of course, are collimated with, with our with our proton, so they also move in, 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 in z direction with the uh, high momentum. So here's my z direction and time. So our collimated particles are going in time in z direction, so they go more or less along this direction, which is the light cone direction, which we call plus direction. So now if I if I decompose my momentum of the quark p in in light cone coordinates, I'll have one component which is large. And this component is usually parameterized with this variable x. So it's x p plus, there p plus is the plus momentum along the light cone of the nucleon. Now there will be uh, transverse momentum, of course. And we know that uh, the, this momentum is almost uh, is almost on shell, so we can parameterize also minus momentum as p squared plus p prop squared divided by two x p plus, of course. And x here is the uh, light cone momentum fraction. That's the ratio of the plus component of the quark uh, momentum over plus component of the proton momentum. So definition of light cone uh, momenta is usual, it's just P, P0 plus PZ or P0 minus PZ for minus direction and some normalization factors here. Now, if we take say some of the uh, frames that we use bright frame, for instance, in bright frame, this P plus momentum is large, it's proportional to Q, if Q is the virtuality, so this large is a large number then uh, the minus momentum will be small because now it will be suppressed by one over Q. And the transverse component P perp, it, it doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't change, but we know it's, it's of order of lambda QCD, that's a non perturbative motion of quarks and gluons inside of the, inside of the nucleon. And therefore, if we take all this, all this information at hand, we can start calculating, say, uh, the hand bake diagram. So let me just quickly browse for it. So calculate this integral of d4 p. Now we take the trace of this gamma mu sitting there. This line here is p plus q slashed this gamma mu. And of course, here downstairs we have our correlator, which is we call phi p. Uh, it's uh, uh, momentum of the quark p. And now, of course, we have a line here that crosses the cut. 
and therefore they have the conservation. So it's the delta of k squared equal to zero or delta p plus q squared equal to zero. And now if we write p plus q squared, we will find out that it's minus q squared plus two x p dot q. And once we work out this delta function, we find that delta x Birkin minus x. That's the contribution at this level of to this diagram. So we don't take into account yet gluon radiation. So it means that at this low level diagram, uh, quarks are propped at exactly value of x Birkin. And that's, that's an incredibly important fact uh, to, to, to remember all the time because x Birkin variable is not what is in the correlator. In the correlator, x can be anything from minus infinity to plus infinity in principle. But kinematically, once we have this interaction, uh, x Birkin becomes actually the variable that describes the, uh, the, the collinear momentum of the, of the parton. So uh, before I go into some details of the gauge wires and the gauge link, it's uh, 1642, I propose let us take uh, a five minute break before I, I go on with my lecture. I think all this information here you guys saw already during this call. I'm just trying to show you my perspective on this, less mathematical maybe. So any, any questions so far? Are people comfortable breaking with gauge symmetry is not respected? Yeah, it's fine. We'll restore the gauge. Um, gauge symmetry. Questions on Zoom? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's break for five minutes or so and then continue. Okay. Five minutes, okay.
All right, yes, I saw it that Chris wrote that you could raise your hand in case you wanted to ask a question. So, but actually you can also interrupt me uh, on Zoom if you like. Talk. So let me continue. And of course, as, as Chris mentioned, everything is very nice about this by local matrix element, but it's not a gauge invariant. Uh, and of course, we need to make sure that we do restore the gauge invariants of, of the objects that we uh, that we want to study, because otherwise we cannot actually relate them to the experimental measurements. Um, the quarks uh, and the remnant of the uh, of the nucleon uh, color it, so they will interact via gluon exchanges. And so gluons will be. Um, exchanged uh, between the remnants of the nucleon and uh, the, uh, the, the the struct quark. So now if we if uh, if minus and perpendicular components of part momentum are neglected then in configuration space only minus components would survive so we have this i p xi only i x p xi minus and so uh, in the diagrammatic view here, if one, if this site is a position psi and this site is position zero, all these gluons will start filling in the gap from, 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 from psi to zero, and they will form what is known as gauge line or gauge link, uh, W that will, that will stretch from, from this position to that position. And so the, um, gauge properties of this object will help us relate uh, possible gauge uh, transformations of the field at this position and that position, making the whole object gauge invariant. And therefore, of course, we never doubt that we can measure this by local elements. Of course, this, uh, this gauge link here will now live in this minus direction. And so only particular, particular, um, particular components of the gauge field will survive and by using uh, a proper uh, a proper gauge condition we can actually eliminate the gauge link altogether by making it equal to unity in a particular gauge and that's why usually when people study deep analysis scattering they never bother to talk about uh, gauge links themselves so that's now let me write the result of the factorization for DIS. So for DIS, we factorized uh, the uh, cross-section into the leptonic parts now uh, and the part that contains the information about the structure of the nucleons, the nucleon. So the universality of PDFs, of course, is also very important. So it means that uh, the same element, uh, same matrix elements are used to describe uh, different, different, different processes. So that we take them from from one experiment, extract them, extract the uh, part distribution functions here PDFs, and we can can, just, can then predict something else. So here are the uh, results of, sorry, just trying to, trying to move this out of the way. Um, results of the description of jet production star at 200 GV. This uh, calculations by uh, Werner Fogelsang. It's next to the order. You can see that there is very good correspondence of the data. And, and the, the results of the experiment. Uh, here are the results of the uh, CDF data now of the jet production compared to next to leading order QCD. And here it's already from CMS at 7 TV for different rapidity intervals, again compared to next to leading order calculations. So that's, there is little doubt that those, uh, those objects are universal. So let's go beyond uh, the collinear picture. And so that's, that's my plan for the continuation of the lecture, uh, the first lecture. So how can we go beyond the, um, beyond the uh, 
collinear limit. So before we do, let us do this uh, mathematical exercise. So let's, we, we, we have our fields that, that live at their particular position, say along minus position and light cone and transverse momentum. So imagine we have, have some offset and transverse momentum so that it's not exactly zero. So why it's not exactly zero? Well, because there is some transfer motion of quarks and therefore we have this uh, e to the minus i z perp k perp part of the Fourier transform that we were talking about. Now we have to keep this in mind, but imagine that this Fourier transform can be done such, such a way that now we are talking about the Fourier transformed fields with some particular particular value of the transfer momentum k perp. Now, in the, by by local matrix elements, we have we have two of them: quark and anti-quark momentum. And imagine that one we have uh, with some transfer momentum k perp, the other with transfer momentum l perp. So now, using this definition here, we can write our Fourier transforms now with Fourier transforms with respect to two different transverse coordinates: z perp and y perp. And uh, what's important is what is happening in this exponent here. It's minus i z perp k perp minus y perp l perp. Okay, so now by virtue of mathematics, we can rewrite. Oops, sorry, going in the wrong direction. We can rewrite uh, the uh, combination z perp k perp minus y perp l perp as one half z perp minus one perp times the sum of the momenta plus one half of some of the positions times the difference of the momentum. So that's the crucial thing that is happening here. So look at this and we see that the average transverse momentum, which is k per plus L per is free a conjugate to position difference of quarks. So it's Z per minus Y per. And uh, the average difference k per minus L per is Fourier conjugate to average position of quarks. And the momentum transfer here, say k perp minus l perp, is Fourier conjugate to the average position so with respect to, say, some center of mass of the nucleon. So this thing here belongs to what we know as GPDs, while this thing here belongs to what we know as TMDs. So now, already from this very simplistic way of Looking at this by local element, you can see that GPDs and TMDs actually are two different beasts. They are not uh, related to each other. However, if they may be related to each other in models, but in full QCD, of course, they will not be able to. So let me tell you a little bit more about GPDs and, 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 and TMDs, introduce them from the point of view of observables. So how come those uh, actually are related to either GPDs or TMDs. So in 1997, Shang Dongji and Anatoly Radyushkin independently pr proposed the so-called deeply virtual Compton scattering as the process that is able to probe the uh, structure of the nucleon from the point of view of GPDs, generalized particle distribution, uh, dis distributions. So now the process is the scattering of the photon of the, of the proton, such that an additional photon is emitted, but the proton itself is not, uh, is not disintegrated. So we have the transverse momentum between the initial and final proton. So Q square here ensures the hard scale. So now the resolution scale is small so that we have point-like interaction with the parton inside of the nucleus. So here again, we have this, uh, this sort of uh, handbag diagram. But now this photon here is not the same as here. It's not the square of the diagram, it's just real photon, which is emitted. Now the delta, which is the difference of the final and initial momentum of the nucleon is the momentum transfer, which you can be, tr can be varied independently. And that's incredibly important because that gives the possibility to connect to the 3D structure. Actually, this was done by Matisse Burkett in 2003. And he um, proposed that uh, the Fourier conjugate of this variable delta perp, the transverse position, the transverse component of the, of the transverse momentum, 
is with respect to r perp, which is r perp is the transverse distance between the center of the nucleon and the active quark. Okay, so that's closer related to, to, to this part here. So k perp minus l perp is delta perp. And this can be done in a particular frame, and it's called the Jalian frame where delta plus is equal to zero, or in terms of the GPDs uh, for these functions, this variable psi or skewness should be equal to zero. And now the T will be actually equal to the minus uh, delta perp squared. And so now we relate the transverse, the transverse uh, picture of the nucleon with GPDs as this Fourier transformation here. And so Christian Weiss in 2009 gave these pictures. So what's, what one can naively see is that if x, x is very large, then, oops, sorry, I was going the wrong direction. If x is very large, then it should be very close to the center of mass of the nucleon. So this only part on carries the whole momentum of the nucleon so that the momentum should shrink, then x becomes large. And indeed from experimental data, that's, 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 that's what you see. Now, of course, what we all love uh, uh, is uh, TMDs. So how can we study TMDs? So quite similarly, but in a different process. So in particular, semi inclusive deep analysis cut, which was proposed uh, many years ago in terms of uh, TMDs by Aram Katsin in 95, by Mulders and Targerman in uh, 95, and by Bora and Mulders in 98. So now the process here uh, is different from that. So now we have the, the process in which but the nucleon is actually uh, decomposed in all possible final states, if you like. And we will keep track of the produced hadrons in the final state. We will measure one of them in the final state. Okay, so now again, I can do this similar trick and write this diagram as this uh, cut diagram as shown here. So. Here we have a marginal part, momentum transfer is zero. And therefore this delta for this diagram here is zero. And therefore, oops, sorry, where am I? And therefore this part is all zero. We're only talking about this components here. So we're talking about TMDs. So Q squared again ensures the hard scale, a point-like interaction. Now we know the parameter that allows us to relate to the three dimensionality of the nucleon is the transverse momentum of the final hadron. Okay, so PHT is the final hadron transverse momentum can be varied independently. And now it can be related to the three dimensionality of the nucleon. And so now our TMDs can be related to TMDs in the position space by this Fourier transform, we can do we can plot our functions as a function of k and see how these distributions change, change with uh, different x, different different k. So again, this three-dimensionality is happening. So it's all, and as you can see, that all these uh, distributions are very closely related. Uh, they, of course, are not the same and can be related 100% in full QCD, but at models they can be. Now again, similarly to DIS uh, for TMDs, and I, I guess you saw it many times already in these lectures. Uh, oops, sorry, so I don't know why it's jumping all the time. So we I extract struct quark from the from the nucleon. It goes into the minus direction on light cone, and uh, similarly to this interaction about with the remnant of the nucleon, the gauge link will arise that will connect uh, position zero and position psi of the quarks. But now this position psi um, of, the, of, of, of the quark is also uh, shifted into the transfer direction as well, not only in the minus direction, but in the transfer direction because we keep track of the transfer momentum of the quarks inside of the nucleon. And therefore the gauge links would have this non-trivial structure. We cannot use the um, just one gauge condition in order to make the gauge link uh, equal to unity, and therefore but the uh, physics of gauge links is very important and, and very interesting for for team D's. So uh, the gauge link is there. In order to study individual team D's, we can project them 
from the correlator. So that's that's our correlator phi x and k perp. Uh, so now it's it's the matrix. In order to get to the knowledge of particular distributions, we need to use projectors. And for unpolarized quarks, it's gamma plus. So the trace with one half of gamma plus will project the distribution of unpolarized quarks inside of the inside of the uh, inside of the nucleon. And so there will be two components here. That's a leading twist. There will be just a distribution of unpolarized quarks inside of the inside of the um, unpolarized nucleon and this function f one t perp, which is the so-called series function, which describes the distribution of unpolarized quarks in, inside of the transversely polarized nucleon. So why it's transversely polarized? Well, because st is he sitting here in this decomposition. If we want to project out the student polarized quarks, we will use the projector gamma plus gamma five. And then again, we will have two contributions here. One will project just usual helicity distributions. The other will pro project the so-called G1 T perp function. Uh, and this function is this so-called um, uh, worm gear function or Katsimu Mulder's function. So why it's worm gear? Well, because it's it's it relates the physics of transverse polarization and longitudinal polarization. The quarks are longitudinally polarized, but the nucleon is polarized transversely. And, uh, and more functions will, will be in transversely polarized quark sector. If we project now with sigma j plus gamma plus, we'll have one, two, three, four functions. H1 is transversity. H1 L perp is uh, related to Again, warm gear function, so it's transversely polarized quarks, but with longitudinally polarized nucleon. H1 T perp, uh, the so called pretzelosity. Uh, that's an interesting function because that's the only function that gives a quadrupole modulation in the momentum space for the nucleon. And the last function is H1 perp here, which is the so called Bohr Mulder's function. That is the function that describes transversely polarized quarks inside of uh, unpolarized nuclear. And we can put those functions now in, in tables. And this is the table from, 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 our, from our book. So we can place them as a, as, as a function of say, polarization of quark and the nuclear polarization. So now they will occupy all this possible slots here. So at leading to is the right functions. Each would represent very different uh, aspect of partonic structure and partonic dynamics. I'll talk more about examples of those functions in my next lecture. Each depend on Bjorkin X, trans momentum, and the scale in each function is to be studied experimentally. If we talk about now fragmentation sector, now how quark is producing a nucleon. So quark can produce say unpolarized or spin zero hadrons. Then uh, they will be described by two fragmentation functions, D1, which is usual uh, analog to the collinear fragmentation function, but it's uh, TMD fragmentation function, unpolarized quarks. H1 perp is the so-called Collins fragmentation function. Again, I'll, in the next lecture, I'll talk, talk more about that. And if we talk about polarized hadrons, either longitudinal or transversely, we have other functions sitting there. And again, they give a lot of interesting ramifications. What happens at higher twists? So if you go to those that are um, that are suppressed by one factor of one over Q or one over pi plus. We can indeed date uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different structures. They all suppress one, one over pi plus, and we have different functions now playing, playing, playing role there. And then, of course, one can ask, are we just doing stamp collection here? So we're producing more and more functions. Well, uh, that's one way of looking at, at, at this problem of proliferation of, of functions. Of course, uh, even though it may be seen as the sum collection, of course, we are in a good company. Because if you think about chemistry, then in chemistry, again, it's all studies of the elements and the elements uh, 
can be seen as some collection. However, studies of any particular element are very important because they can lead to discoveries, can lead to production of new materials and so on and so forth. Therefore, it's not only stamp collections, just enriching our physical interpretation in physics. I think that's the end of my lecture one. And so I actually deliberately went uh, a little bit quicker because that's the generic, inter generic introduction, if you like, to, to all my lectures. Are there any questions so far? Uh, Andrew has a question here in the room. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hi. This is uh, probably something hi, I... Hi, Andrew. This is probably something I also would have asked Bert, or if he was lecturing today. On, on slide yeah. 34, when you're doing these connections to three-dimensional structure, um, I know there's been some, some success for defining two-dimensional and transverse densities that are Lorentz invariant that you could connect the dots back to form factors. Uh, because I know uh, this loosely speaking prescription of densities are Fourier transforms of form factors in a specific frame. The, the, this frame dependence of it, uh, people like Dr. Burkhardt aren't a huge fan of. My question is, are there other form factors, I'm sorry, are there other two dimensional densities like besides the charge density that we've learned how to consistently define in this Lorentz invariant way? I only know of the one. Yeah, um, I, 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 I think in a way, well, I, I think strictly speaking, what, what, what the telling is right. So that's maybe the only example that, that we have. Uh, what I wanted to say is that, um, GPDs and TMDs themselves um, are such examples as well. So that in principle, we can we can study them, uh, say, on lattice QCD. Um, as for the chart densities, yeah, there is there is a lot of work uh, of, um, of 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 relating to 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 the uh, to the two dimensional densities. I'm not a big expert, so actually a good thing would be to ask uh, Matthias himself. I think he he actually volunteered to answer questions, and maybe he will be able to do so on do so next week. So I'll probably refrain from from giving you more information about that. So maybe. Matthias is the better person to, to talk about that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I figured I figured uh, that would be low hanging fruit that would have already been picked if those uh, if other form factors would be so easily related to the two dimensional density. So sure. I, I, I believe so, but you know, people 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 often you know, miss something serious. Thank you. Another question here in the room. Uh, well, uh, can you go back to, I think, uh, 53? 53? Yes. This one. Yeah. Yes. Oh, no. I mean, the one that talks about the half um, one prop, I think. The BDF F1 prop. Does it have any polarization? Uh, yes, this one. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, the first the first equation that has F one, yes, this one, mm -hmm. the F one T prop. Yes. Does it have any polarization uh, structure? Sure. Yeah. Actually, this this this, this will be introduced uh, directly in my second lecture, so you'll you'll see how how it works. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a very good question. So that. That is actually my aim for 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 these for the second question sec, second lecture sorry to go more go more in details on what this thing looks like and why it looks like this way. Thank you. So maybe actually let me let me maybe just open it and.
We don't see any other questions at the moment. Yeah. So let, let me then continue and do remaining 18 minutes so that we'll have more time for Mathematica at the end. We go. Right, so that's that's now going to be about semi-inclusive analysis scattering and the uh, uh, the the, the uh, hands-on with Mathematica. So you don't need to have Mathematica. I'll, I'll just show, but hopefully you can access Mathematica and actually try it yourself. So now let me introduce semi-inclusive analysis scattering. Of course, I did it in the context of of of, of um, of studies of TMDs. So without the uh, embellishment with the soft factor, the factorization for CDS looks like this. We have a uh, lower part, part of, the, of the diagram there, which describes the distribution of quarks and other quarks inside of the, inside of the nucleon. Now we have a leptonic tensor here, and we have the quark that fragments into an observed hadron, which we pick on. And this part is described by, by the uh, correlator that contains TMD fragmentation functions. So we now disentangle everything into a part which has fragmentation, part which has distribution, and part which has this elementary scattering. So uh, the process uh, can be seen like this. So we have uh, the interaction of the photon with the, with the nucleon. And, and so now we have the axis of this interaction. So this is the famous Z direction along which I would like to have my nucleon or the photon to move. The lepton scatters in the plane. So that will be my lepton scattering plane. With respect to the lepton scattering plane, which happens to be event per event, if you like, I'll measure uh, produced hadron. So now produced hadron will also define a plane. And so there will be the azimuth angle phi h of this produced hadron. There will be polarization vector of the, of the nucleon. And so this polarization vector will also have the, the azimuth angle phi s. So once I write my cross section, I'll write it in terms of uh, in terms of structure functions. There are eighteen structure functions for um, for the semi-inclusive deep axis scattering. Each structure function encodes pattern dynamics via convolutions of TMDs. Uh, then factorization is applicable, and so we have all those results in our TMD book. So we will use. Uh, variables to describe uh, our, our cross sections. Well, it will be working variable X, then elasticity Y, which is P dot Q divided by P dot L. Um, the variable that describes uh, fragmentation Z, which is P dot PH divided by P dot Q and Q squared with virtuality. So those are the variables that we'll use for our cross sections. And the TMD factorization is valid in a particular region. So it is the region there, uh, PT over Z is much less than Q. Well, this PT over Z is the QT of the photon in, this, in the frame there. There the proton and the produced hadron are head to head. So it's an interesting QC regime. Uh, then recoil is actually happening from a low transverse momentum. So it's in, obviously non-perturbative in a sense regime. It's very important for studies of non-perturbative physics and non-perturbative um, content of the, of the nucleon. So each structure functions will, will be a convolution of uh, TMDs that describe distribution and TMDs that describe uh, fragmentation. And the generic way uh, to write them is shown here. So of course, in the final uh, process, we don't know what was the underlying quark momentum or the underlying momentum of the fragmenting quark. And therefore we integrate over the momentum of the incoming 
quirk transfer momentum or the uh, outgoing quirk. Now they of course are related to the transfer momentum of the produced hadron and they're related uh, by, 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 by this delta function. So Z times K perp. Uh, so K perp is the transverse momentum of the quark inside of the nucleon plus P perp, which is the transverse momentum of the hadron with respect to a quark direction should give us the transverse momentum of the hadron. So now there may be some different weights here, which we'll look at in a moment. And again, we will have these two uh, team leads. One will describe the distribution, one describe the fragmentation. So that's the correlation um, of the momentum of the quarks in the momentum space. So here's here's the here's here's the whole result for the for for the cross section. So the cross section again. It, is written in terms of x, y, z, p, t, perp, and phi h, and uh, uh, this variable psi, which can be uh, used to denote the transverse polarization of the nucleon. So now we have the prefactor, which is the kinematical prefactor sitting there. We have the uh, structure functions, which correspond to the Unpolarized scattering. So now, once we take out of the cross section structure functions uh, which describe the unpolarized scattering, what we have in the in, in this remainder here is one plus some particular azimuthal modulations and asymmetries. Okay. So now, how do we read all this uh, all, 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 all this um, cross sections? Well. Uh, first, uh, our structure functions will have uh, some labels here. So, for instance, this comma t here means that this uh, structure function is for virtual photon polarization, which is transverse, or this one, which is longitudinal. Now, in uh, in, in in structure functions or asymmetries here, there will be terms weighted with lambda. The lambda is the beam polarization. And we also assume that target polarization is non-zero, so it has a longitudinal component as L and transverse component as T. And of course, they combine, of course, into the spin vector of the nucleon, such that this T squared plus SL squared is equal to one. So this factor epsilon here is the ratio of the longitudinal to transverse photon flux ratio. And gamma here is 2mx divided by q, kinematical factor here. So angles here again, phi h is the azimuthal angle of the hadron, and phi s is the azimuthal angle of the uh, polarization vector, transverse polarization. So then we talk about the asymmetries and asymmetries can be studied experimentally because the now experimental experimentalists can actually do the full analysis of this cross section. So for each asymmetry, we have the label, which is angular dependence. For instance, for this one, AU cos phi, it means that the angular dependence in the cross section actually goes with cos phi. Now these two labels, tell us about beam polarization and target polarization. So AU U cos phi means that uh, the polarization of the beam is unpolarized, target is unpolarized, and the modulation in the cross section is cos phi. For instance, this AU cos 2 phi again is for unpolarized beam polarization, unpolarized B a target, and the modulation is cos to phi. So now if we, we were to integrate over polarization so that none of our, non, neither beam nor target is polarized, we will just end up with these three terms. So it's one plus cos phi of some asymmetry plus cos to phi of some other symmetry. And indeed, that's what we can actually have in series only these two modulations if there are no polarizations. 
So now we will have also these blocks here and there, which correspond to the so-called single spin asymmetries. Single spin asymmetries mean that we have only we need to have only the one particle polarized. So it's either beam as here, so beam is being polarized, but the nucleon is all polarized, or the target. Unpolarized beam, target polarization, sine phi H modulation. And it can be either for longitudinal or transverse polarization. So here it's longitudinal polarization of the beam or longitudinal polarization of the target. So two asymmetries can be measured or transverse polarization of the target for unpolarized beam. We can have one, two, three, four, five asymmetries. Or we can have double spin asymmetries. Then we have to have polarization both of the of the nucleon and and the target. So here are the examples for the initial polarization of the nucleon and the target. ALL, for instance, that would describe the helicity distributions. Or here, it's the longitudinal polarization of the beam, but transverse polarization of the target. And so if one counts them all, there are 18. And of course, here, this prefactor here is the unpolarized cross section. So now if we if we talk just about the single spin asymmetries, so this block here and that block there, we can study what is the, the what's the origin of those asymmetries and see whether the asymmetries themselves are coming from twist two, which meaning in Team D jargon, whether these asymmetries are suppressed with one over Q or not. And then I use this label, green label for twist two or red label for twist three. One can see that we have one, two, three, four asymmetries at twist two level and four asymmetries at twist three level, meaning that those asymmetries are suppressed by one over Q. So now generically, then we have contributions from this twist two sector. It means that we can describe the asymmetry in terms of TMDs from the tables that I've shown before. Uh, yeah, tables from twist two. So for instance, here. So let me let me just insist on some of them. So A U T sine phi H minus phi S, that's the convolution of series function and unpolarized permutation function. That's the series asymmetry. We'll talk more about this later on. A U T sine phi H plus phi S, that's the convolution of oops, that's the type of sorry, it's H1 transverse T times convoluted with the uh, with the uh, Collins fragmentation function. So these are the two I'll talk more in my second lecture. Now, if we have those which are suppressed by one over Q, one expects to have uh, twist three functions. And this E, for instance, is an example of twist three function. Or this H tilde is, is, is an example of twist three function in our decomposition. So for double spin asymmetries, we have two of them, which are uh, leading twists, twist two, it's ALL, the convolution of uh, helicity, TMDs and fragmentation, unpolarized fragmentation TMDs, and ALT cos phi H minus phi S, which is the convolution of G1T, the warm gear function and Unpolarized fragmentation function. And three others will be at higher twist, twist level. So even though that they are at higher twist level, it doesn't mean, of course, that they are not interesting. Actually, they might be very interesting. And one of the examples why I, I think so is this. So let's look just at this line here, which describes the unpolarized modulation of single spin asymmetry. So again, there are three terms constant in the angle cos phi modulation and cos two phi modulation. So cos phi modulation is twist three. So it's related to this F1 convoluted with D1 perp. Cos two phi is 
these two. It's related to the convolution of bohr molders function and uh, transfer or um, Collins fragmentation function. Sorry, the, here's again the typo. There shouldn't be tilde here. It's just Collins fragmentation function. Now, in spite of the fact that cos 2 phi is a leading twist asymmetry, it's much smaller than cos phi asymmetry. So cos phi asymmetry, even though it's suppressed by one over Q, inside has quite large functions. So in particular, in some approximations, if one works in the so-called one zero Vilcic approximation, this would be related just to the unpolarized structure function. And therefore, even though it's suppressed, this is probably the biggest asymmetry observed experimentally. It's around 40%. Therefore, one can say that this function is also very interesting to, to study. And of course, this uh, unpolarized cross section FUUT is just the convolution of unpolarized uh, TMD with the unpolarized fragmentation TMD. It's twist two again. So it's 1728. And at this point, I, I wanted to give you a little bit more details into some of those functions. In particular, I'll follow up on this question about the polarization dependence of this first term, which contains series function, I'll describe it also in details, I hope, and answer that question. But I think it's a very good point for us to adjourn for, for a coffee break, maybe for half an hour. Chris, do you think it makes sense for us to stop and then That's continue yeah. now? Thank you. Thank you for the future. Um, uh, I know this is very te technical here, but uh, do, do you guys have any 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 questions? We have a couple I, minutes. I, I, I believe I believe also Ian uh, showed this yesterday. So I don't think he showed the eighteen. <laughs> oh, eighteen. Yeah, yeah. We 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 try to make sure that in our book we don't go very hard on students, and so we didn't include uh, all eighteen in chapter ask. two. Yeah, kind of a uh, concept. I mean, naive question here. I mean, are some of these more important than others to measure in 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 some qualitative sense, or uh, like, are there some? Um, um, are some of them more important than others to answer things that we always advertise in the TMT community, yes. like studying the you know, being able to map out the three D the structure of the proton or Solve right. the work so, and are some of these connected to those problems more yes. than others? So, 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 so for instance, <clears throat> these two, of course, are cornerstones of, of our studies. So, these are serious asymmetry and Collins asymmetry. So, serious asymmetry is related to serious function, which is very, very interesting from a point of view of its properties uh, in terms of the gauge link of the difference between Jalian and Cities and also how the nucleon looks with the polarization. Uh, the uh, one, sorry again, it's a typo here, there shouldn't be perp here, related to transversity is extremely important because that gives us a possibility actually to study transversity or tensor charge of the nucleon. And therefore it's very interesting and it gives us access also to coordinates fragmentation function, which is fundamental. So I would say that if anything, I would measure this too. Other functions are important. Uh, they may be, in a way, if you like, start ranking them, be like silver candidates, because this, this, this two, for instance, contain information. This one is about Pratt's velocity. It's very much suppressed, so it's very difficult to measure experimentally. This one is the, about the uh, warm gear function again. Of course, it's very interesting concept. Uh, however, there is much less theoretical work uh, on that. And therefore, maybe it's not as interesting as, as this two were as an example. Um, one of the things that I would say maybe is extremely interesting to, 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 to study is the ones that contain this function H tilde, because it function H tilde is, uh, turns out it's twist three function, but it's extremely important to describe the proton proton scattering uh, asymmetries. So it emerges as being, being very important. Um, 
of course, helicity distributions are very important. So this is, this is very much interesting to measure. Uh, maybe less so for this one because you know much less phenomenology is done in a sense. In this I wouldn't discard anything in in a way. If if an experiment list is measuring, and one has a particular polarization in the uh, in the play in the in the experiment, it's very easy to study basically all of them or most of them. It's very for if one studies say ALL, why not study ALL cos phi? But of course, it's a question of manpower. Very for maybe. Experiment list would opt to study ALL because it's related to helicity, and helicity is related to the spin decomposition of the nucleon or so. So they are they're, they're all equal for me, but some of them are more equal than, than, than ours, of course, due to the more interest in the community. Cost to phi is extremely interesting thing, thing to measure. It's, it's very, very difficult actually to 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 to, to describe it. But it's very interesting from ex experimental and theoretical point of view because it gives us a possibility to relate to subleading twists and collinear factorization as well. And there was very nice work done by previously in connecting collinear factorization to, to this sort of asymmetries very recently. Okay, thank you. The coffee is here. So we'll perfect. Take our okay. So we do half an hour, 27 minutes, three yes, come minutes. Uh, on the hour. Sounds or, good. Perfect. Thank you. Good. Go ahead, Alexei. Perfect. Yeah, so I'll continue discussing now more details about uh, some particular examples of, of, of asymmetries. Uh, and then uh, I'll go into the hands-on um, meeting, showing you some mathematical notebooks and introducing the exercises. So I have um, I thought a little bit about the, two, the Lorentz invariant two-dimensional two distributions uh, triggered by a uh, question by Andrew. So not that I can eliminate you more on that, uh, for, for instance, one can think maybe about uh, team Ds which are integrated over the um, momentum of X, uh, of, of the fraction X, uh, and then the, they will be related to a particular two-dimensional two um, distributions. Now, what's, what's the physical meaning or whether people worked on that? So maybe again, Matthias should know should should know better whether it is for for GPDs of course the relationship is quite uh, quite straightforward if you integrate over x of GPDs then you go into the you know, form factors and they would correspond to the two dimensional distributions and that is of course very interesting uh, um, theoretically phenomenologically as well for 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 TMDs. I'm not quite sure, but maybe there is something there as well. All right, is that so what do we know about structure functions in series? So, um, in case I were not able to finish the lecture today, just you know uh, the punchline. So this is a series function f1 t perp non-universal, Cohen's function uh, h1 perp universal. So that's probably something that I would like you to 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 remember. Now, of course, uh, I, then I plot these functions here. I also show some sort of modulations. And uh, there was also a question about polarization dependence. So we'll talk about this a little bit more. So hopefully that question will be answered. So a series function f1 d perp, I describe some polarized quarks inside of transversely polarized nucleon. It encodes the correlation of orbital motion with the spin. So that's probably the uh, importance of this function, why right? it's important. So the correlation between the motion of quarks and the spin of the nucleon. Um, why theoretically it turned out to be very important is that um, sign change of series function uh, was shown to be a fundamental consequence of QCD. 
So now how can we understand the sign change of series function? Imagine I have this sort of simplistic series like process. There are photon scatters of a quark of a particular color. And then uh, the uh, die quark interacts with the scattered quark. Now, uh, in this case, quark die quark um, are in the color neutral state. And therefore, this interaction between quark uh, and uh, the die quark will be attractive. They want to stay together. Well, if we uh, look at the analog of uh, series function in Drelian, in Drelian, what we have is the uh, um, annihilation of quark anti quark pair. So imagine we have, um, let's say, a red colored anti quark that annihilates with, with a quark which is anti red. Now, uh, the remnant of the nucleon will be red, and now red and red colors will. Uh, will experience repulsive interaction. And therefore, physically, one could imagine that here's the difference between these two mechanisms. And if one does it um, in details in full glory of QCT, one finds out that the series function is changing sign between Drelian and Cities. And it's related to the different direction of the gauge link associated with series function in Cities and Drelian. It goes beyond just team defactorization. If it is also correct in collinear factorization of Drelian in CDs. Also, their directions of gauge links are opposite. However, by the gauge choice, one can make the gauge links to be equal to unity. But nevertheless, if this doesn't work for a series function, then uh, collinear factorization is also in trouble. And therefore, studies of the sign change of series function are milestones for for DOE and NS efforts at uh, the United States. Transfers TH1 perp function. So that's the axially symmetric function here, as you can see. It's the only source of information on tensor charge of the nucleon. Very interesting, important, and fundamental tensor charge. <clears throat> it couples to Collins fragmentation function or to dihadron interference fragmentation functions in the series. Um, well, this function is currently chiral load, so it needs to, to couple to chiral load's function in order to create a chiral even absorbable. So the tensor charge uh, contribution of quark or GTQ is the integral from zero to one of transversity for quark minus transversity for anti-quark. So it turns out that some lattice, this is being studied very extensively. So in a way it is um, some sort of overlap between the interest of TMD physics, interest of lattice, but also interest of beyond standard model physics, because um, in standard in the standard model Lagrangian, there are no tensorial interactions; they are not renormalizable. However, in nature, there may be tensorial interactions, and therefore, going beyond maybe uh, standard model is going into these tensor interactions, and the search for the tensorial interactions are also related to the value for the tensor charge. So the couplings depend on that. So um, let me go a little bit more into the formula. So the, for the series function, we have unpolarized quark inside transverse polarized nucleon. So if I were to use X, K perp and, and the spin, then I would write it into, into structures. One is spin independent, that's just unpolarized TMD. And the other should couple to some structure, which is uh, which is this color. So we can uh, use the uh, pseudo vector for the spin and create another pseudo vector by doing the cross product of the momentum of the nucleon and k perp. So that's also will, will be a pseudo vector and dotting them will give me this color and therefore that's the legitimate contribution. So now it's not, it's pretty easy to see that this sort of combination here correlates the motion of the quark. So P cross K perp gives me the sort of analog of the orbital momentum and the spin of the nucleon. For the Collins function, we have one polarized hadron, which is produced from transversely polarized quark. And again, uh, we have the transmentum of the hadron with respect to quark direction and polarization of the quark transversely polarized. Now, again, we can, can have two structures, one just describing the unpolarized fragmentation 
of quark uh, into a hadron uh, that requires momentum uh, fraction z of the, with, with its momentum, or this correlation again, uh, very similar to Severus mechanism, but now in fragmentation. And it's weighted by this function, which is called H1 perp or Collins function. So both those functions were actually proposed to describe the uh, spin asymmetries uh, observed in proton proton scattering. So proton proton, transversely polarized proton production of pines. So now here's the answer to the question that I received at the end of the first lecture. So let's look at this structure fx kt and st and let's assume that the polarization of nucleon is uh, in a long y direction so st is zero one so now this uh, this combination here will be very simply just kx so now in the momentum space the deformation is just x times the function of of, of uh, x squared plus y squared there is x and y is just kt, x and kt, y. And that is very simply a dipole deformation. So that's the dipole deformation of the nucleon density in the momentum space. That's how it looks like in the um, three dimensional picture. So, and that's how it looks if I do the uh, tomographic plots. So if I start slicing this along some 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 lines in X. So that's how it would look like. This is the dipole deformation of the nucleon. So it's interesting that, uh, of course, um, what we know in this case is that um, if there is no correlation between the spin and the uh, and the momentum, so this, this function f1 t perp is zero, then uh, the result of the experiment should give me no correlations with the axial symmetric uh, distribution here. And kx and ky. If there is a correlation, then the the, the, the the maximum distribution will be shifted by some amount from the origin. Now it's interesting that uh, of course uh, this shift should have some physical interpretation. And physical interpretation is the average, say, uh, integral of this function of the first moment of this function. Now this first moment of this function in kt space is related. Um, in simple models or in simple approximations to the twist free functions in collinear QCD. So here's the picture that uh, we obtained quite a long time ago in 2009 after the analysis of CDS data for uh, series asymmetries for up and down quarks. So what you can see here is the systematic shift along X direction. So the spin of the nucleon is along Y here and there. So the shift for up quark is to the right, shift for down quark is to the left. So now what it is related to physically. Uh, the explanation of this shift was actually given by the first time by Matthias Burkert. So it's a pity that um, he doesn't give this lecture, but let me try my best to describe why it happens. So imagine uh, up quarks um, are rotating in such a way that uh, there are correlation, there's correlation between the spin and the orbital momentum create, created by this motion here of these up quarks. So imagine also that the photon that probes the quarks is directed into the screen, okay? So now to the right, uh, the photon will, we'll see the quark with its momentum slightly higher than to the left. So, and then um, uh, Matthias called this current G plus and this current he called G minus. Uh, if this momentum of this quark is changing, so it, it changes the uh, average momentum of X carried by, 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 by the quark. And therefore the distribution here and there will be different. And he showed that uh, the maximum of the distribution is inevitably shifting to this position to the right because of the rotation. So once we see this, here is that's the interpretation. The quarks are rotating such that they are coming out of the screen towards you. And you are the virtual photons that see this quarks so that you observe those quarks more to the right rather than to the left. And therefore this shift is happening. 
and this is the, uh, this is the semi-classical model which was introduced by Matthias. Okay, so now series function describe actually the strength of this correlation between the spin and the orbit of motion of the quarks p cross kt. Collins function describes the strength of correlation between k cross p perp and the spin uh, spin of the of a quark. Both functions so I extensively study experimentally, phenomenologically, theoretically. I'll tell you a little bit more details on that, but let me just remind you that in the cross section we have those uh, with sine phi h plus phi s for the um, convolution of transverse T and Collins fragmentation function. That's the Collins asymmetry, if you like, and sine phi h minus phi s, which is the convolution of series. TMD and uh, unpolarized uh, fragmentation TMD. And this is actually why I called my notebooks Sievers for this one and Collins for that one. So that's what I, I will ask you to study. So what do we know from uh, theoretical and phenological works? Um, in, in his paper in 2003, Pabellica showed the large NC result, which was an interesting. So he um, derived that for up work, uh, the series function should be approximately equal and with the opposite sign to the down quark. So they should be of opposite signs. And then look at this picture, which we got from phenology. Well, up quark is shifted to, to the right, down quark is to the left, then physically what it means is actually that the up quark and down quark have opposite signs of the series functions. And uh, that is actually confirming this study of uh, Pabellitz in 2003. It's not the sign change of the series function between Sidious and Relian, but it's the sign change between the quark flavors up and down. Um, again, Matthias Burkert in 2002 related uh, series function to the GPDE and the anomalous magnetic moment. And in the particular model, uh, he conjectured that uh, series function are proportional to this anomalous magnetic moment contributions. And again, it's working pretty well in phenological instructions. It predicted also correct sign of series asymmetries in series. It was shown to be model dependent, unfortunately, because uh, as, as we saw, uh, it's impossible practically to introduce relations between GPDs and TMDs in full QCD. You know, only in model, models it will work, but you know, probably it was a good model. So it was shown to be model dependent by Mason, Metz, and Gurk in 2007, but it was used in phenological extractions by Vaket and Ratich in 2011, so maybe this can continue. And well, uh, this sort of relations will, um, will, will, will be reinstated in some ways in Wigner distributions when and we start studying them. There are some rules. Well, again, thanks to Matthias Burkert and to who, uh, who proposed it. So it, it's based solely on conservation of transverse momentum. So if we have shifts of transverse momentum to the right and to the left, of course, uh, the overall shift should be zero because uh, the nucleon is still moving as such. So it cannot change its position because of the polarization. And therefore, uh, he introduced this average uh, transfer momentum shift, kt average, which is related to this formula. So here it's f1 t perp 1 is sitting, okay? f1 at 1 is a particular kt moment of the function. So actually the first moment of the function team d. So once we take this integral, we get the first moment, which depends on x. And so in some way, it should be related to collinear distributions. And again, uh, it was conjectured to be um, related to uh, the so-called choose term and matrix, matrix element choose term and functions that are twist-free functions. And um, we have some caveats that can be proven also for, for, for team this um, with full glory. And assume some rule tells us that if I integrate over X of this one of these shifts uh, for all species of quarks should give to zero or it gives this uh, relations to the first moments of series functions. So the moments are very important. They, they are used very widely in 
in, uh, in, in phenology. And I'll show some examples later on. Again, there are many extractions uh, without taking into account full glory of TMD evolution. So this shower of particles uh, relations between different, um, different Q squares. Oops, sorry, I'm going too far. Um, but still they are very insightful because they give us uh, an idea of what's happening on the non-perturbative level for the nucleon and extractions with TMD evolution were done starting from uh, 2014 at uh, next to leading log level and um, in last year by Chivaria, John Gokang and John Terry did next to next to leading log analysis and uh, Alexey Vladimirov and I, we did um, and three yellow analysis of the series functions. So still these pictures hold so in all these analyses we get very similar, very similar qualitative results. Of course, uh, from the point of view of prediction power, extractions of TMD evolution are the best. Again, I told you already about the sign change. That's very important. Uh, a lot of people worked on, 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 on those relations. And a lot of facilities are working towards uh, quantifying those. So the first experimental hints on the sign change came from A sub N in W and Z production from STAR in 2015. Here are these series asymmetries for W plus and W minus and the sorted line here and there is the result from Zhang Bo and Zhang Wei Chu in 2009, taking into account sign change and the dashed line what happens if the sign changes is not is not happening? So it's already quite interesting to see. And of course, from Compass to Van Seventeen, there was the first uh, point in Drell Yan in pine production, and this point here is sitting in positive values. It's compatible with the models with sign change. If sign change didn't happen, that's what would measure. Okay, so for Collins function, let me. Switch gears a little bit. A, a, a similar sum rule uh, is also is also possible. So it's done by Schaffer and Treif in ninety nine, and by Messner, Metz, and Pitonik in two thousand ten. So again, we can we can we can introduce the average shift uh, by introducing this first moment of Collins fragmentation function, and the sum rule, of course, then again telling us if we if we took this average momentum shifts integrated over all these and for all Hadron species, they should give zero. So if only pines are considered then favorite and unfavorite fragmentations, meaning that pines which are produced from quarks, which are already in the wave function or pines produced from quarks, which are not in the wave function and favorite should have neg opposite signs. And that's what we see, what we see phenologically. A very important uh, Analysis also was done for universality of TMD frag fragmentation functions, and it was shown by Metz and then Metz and Collins that for CDs and a plus minus we had the same fragmentation functions, uh, Collins fragmentation functions. So they don't change sign, nothing happens. And then it was also extended to proton proton by uh, by by Leonard and Mulders and uh, Borkan, or just like Yuan 2010 showing that for all these processes, Collins fragmentation functions are universal. Very non trivial is the results. And it agrees phenologically and allows for global fits. As such, uh, Collins asymmetry is now uh, present in, uh, in Sidious. So the FUT sine phi H plus phi S, it's the convolution of transverse and Collins function, again, with this uh, sine dependence. Uh, of course, in order to extract transverse, we need to know what's Collins fragmentation function. Ho fortunately, in the plus and minus, there is an analog of, of this um, uh, asymmetry, but only done with Collins functions. Now the uh, asymmetry is in cos two phi, as here. So it's if we if we if we have a plus and minus, then one produced hadron in a plus and minus give us. A, give us um, a plane, the other hadron gives another plane, 
the azimuth angle is phi zero, then cos two phi zero is produced by this coordinates coordinates. So we can combine them and then um, extract the functions. So now it's 1824. Let me probably talk for a few minutes and then we can probably for 10 minutes. So uh, experimental results you have seen already uh, in, in the last couple of days. So for serious asymmetries in Sirius, there are results from Hermes and from Compass and Jefferson lab for different targets, uh, for deuterium proton targets, for different species of Hadron's product pro produced pi plus and pi minus, pi plus, pi minus, k plus, k minus. So they all related to this convolution here. Okay, so that's the convolution I introduced before, um, the shorthand for this convolution. Uh, that's the fun weight function, W, and that's series function sitting there. It's D1, unpolarized fragmentation function. Now for transverse single spin asymmetries, you know, there are also many observed for coordinates asymmetry in CDC and plus and minus. In particular, here are the examples for compost uh, on um, the proton target, I think, for pi plus and pi minus, k plus, k minus, and k zero, coordinates asymmetries. Also, Hermes Jellup had results. Those are related to uh, convolution of transverse and coins fragmentation functions. Here are the results from Bell in 2008. Now have results from Babar and Bess 3 and also new Bell results in a plus and minus annihilation. There are uh, the symmetry, which is quite sizable here, is produced of the convolution of coins fragmentation functions. Now we have also results uh, in real young for serious effects, serious effects uh, for star. Here are all the same data that I showed before, but now is a function of PT of the W. And here there is the result of compass. That's the serious function in real young now, which has to have a different sign in convoluted with the unpolarized distribution for real young. And as I mentioned before, this function series and coordinates functions were introduced to describe actually these asymmetries, which are the so-called ASABAN asymmetries in proton proton scattering. So let me go by very quickly here. So maybe the simplest asymmetry one can measure is just come scatter two protons, one of them transversely polarized, and measure how many points go to the left or to the right of the scattering. So this Transverse polarization will allow me to define a plane for the lepton and I can combine what is left, what is right. And it turns out that the difference between left and righters is quite sizable. It goes up to like 30%. And here it's for Brahms at 62 GV and 200 GV for pi plus. And for pi minus, it turns out to be in the, in the opposite direction. Okay, so remember we were talking that series functions change sign between up and down. So that looks like um, a very plausible ex explanation. But however, for pi, pi zero, again, we see quite a sizable signal. And then uh, for pi zero, of course, we cannot just describe by series functions because for pi zero, pre presumably, if they were different for pi plus and pi minus, they would give zero here. So this should be described by some sort of fragmentation mechanism. And now again, that's that, that's why uh, John Collins then produced his function to describe the, the asymmetry. And here again, you can see that at higher energies, 500 GV, we still have very sizable, sizable, sizable asymmetries. And um, it was um, worked out that in this particular case, and we now, then we speak about ace band. We cannot just simply talk about team defactorization because uh, for team defactorization, we need two scales, um, one scale much smaller than the other. And that gives us a possibility to introduce resummation, to introduce uh, rapid divergence, and so on and so forth. Well, to, 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 to deal with rapid divergence because of that. Now, here there is only one scale present, which is transfer momentum of the hadron produced. 
and therefore some different explanation should be should be should be used and this explanation is the so-called uh, twist free factorization in collinear qcd so imagine that you have a possibility of scatter not from just one parton but for a couple of partons and this would inevitably be a twist free function so now this twist free function in principle can be spin dependent and one of these examples here is the Chusterman matrix element uh, introduced by Jean Wei and, 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 and George. And uh, it's related to the, the uh, intrinsic correlation between uh, the wave function with quark and a gluon and the wave function with just one quark inside of the nucleon participating in the interaction. So there's quark gluon quark correlator introduced by Jean Wei and George in 1999. And it's again, maybe related in models, but maybe more, uh, better in full QCD, hopefully, to the first moment of the spheres functions. So there is relationship between spheres functions and collinear functions here. There may be different ways of to relate them, integral relations. So um, I, I believe Ian spoke about uh, those in his lectures, but also created product relations, then we actually expand our matrix elements and relate to collinear matrix elements. This is the standard way of doing relations of the TMDs, which are unpolarized, for instance, relating them to collinear um, distribution functions. But here, that's the integral way. So TMD and, and collinear twist factorization agree in the overlap, overlapping region of, of uh, applicability, which was shown in many, many papers. So it means that if we are to do the global analysis of the data for TMD factorization, in principle, we can also add the data for collinear twist factorization. And here, of course, there is one other term which is very important which is the fragmentation term. So now in this fragmentation term, in order to produce the symmetry, one can have um, transversity, which couples to the collinear, to the collinear analogs of Collins fragmentation function. All this collinear analog is H1 per the first moment. Surprise, surprise. Again, the, the uh, integral relation between this matrix element, which is again the, um, quark gluon quark um, fragmentation function in twist free formalism. And also one function, which is H tilde here. H tilde should, should play a role here. So in, in the language of TMDs, this is the subleading function. In the language of collinear, uh, collinear twist free uh, functions, they are the same on the same footing as H1 per one here. So now again, uh, this uh, one unknown function in principle, h perp, uh, h, h tilde can be related to a particular absorbable and then, 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 then I answer it to, to Chris about whether some functions were more interesting than others or some asymmetries. So here's an example of an asymmetry which turns out to be very interesting. It's f u t sine phi s or a u t sine phi s if you like it's proportional to transversity which couples to this function h tilde and, uh, and again measuring this would give us some insight on what is happening in the twist free collinear limit for proton proton scattering so now it's actually my pleasure to to, to, to introduce this uh, example of uh, phenological analysis, which is JAM20 analysis. And this was uh, led by uh, Justin Camarota, who's actually in, in the audience, I hope, today. So uh, this paper is pretty important in my view. And uh, JAM did this uh, in 2020, published in 21. So why it's important, what this analysis is about. So we decided to try combine all possible experimental data on single spin asymmetries, in particular from CDS, E plus and minus drill yan, and also from proton proton, which is described by collinear factorization to demonstrate the common origin of single spin asymmetries in these various, various processes, in various uh, measurements. 
and we wanted to extract a you know, universal set of non particular functions that describes all of them. So now, what are the observables that we can include? So those are Sievers and Collins asymmetries in, in Cities in, and Drillian for Sievers. Uh, we have uh, proton and deuterium targets. We have different uh, different uh, hadrons produced by plus, by minus, by zero. So they give us a possibility to relate and extract Sievers, Sievers team D. Now in uh, in in Trillion we have uh, proton proton and production of W W minus and Z boson. Again, that's related to series function here. Or pi minus onto proton into the lepton pairs, muon pairs, again related to those functions. We have uh, Collins asymmetry in, C in Sievers, in Cities, which is related to transverse and Collins fragmentation functions. Collins asymmetries in the plus and minus related to Collins fragmentation functions and A sub band. So that was the crucial part of, of our analysis. Then, then actually we used the um, relations between uh, TMDs and these three functions in order to calculate what's happening in proton and proton. So, in total, 18 observables and six non perturbative functions, severs for up and down, transverse for up and down, and coordinates for favorite and unfavorite. At this point, we didn't uh, extract H tilde, which is also present in, in our formula here, just because we didn't have enough information for this asymmetry here, unfortunately. So it came as a noise. So it, we had a very broad kinematic coverage to test universality of those functions. And the analysis was performed at part on model level in order to see whether we can describe things with universal set. You, a lot of observables, a lot of different experiments. One would think, how many functions do you need to, to introduce? It turns out that one, two, three types of functions only. And it's uh, transversity for up and down quark they are here, so for up quark is positive, for down quark it's negative. Uh, it turns out that it is very compatible with previous extractions. Sievers function, again, we extracted the collinear analogs so the first moment of them for up and down. And again, for up quark it's negative, for down quark it's positive. And remember what Pabelica told us that they have to be opposite. And they are also related um, with the previous extractions quite well. Collins fragmentation function for favorite and unfavorite. Remember what uh, uh, Schaffer Treff some rule tells us that uh, most probably favorite and unfavorite should be of opposite signs. Indeed, they are of opposite signs. So, three types of functions they describe all possible data on single spin asymmetries. For Sirius, that's how it looks like for uh, pi plus and pi minus, pi plus and, and red, pi minus and blue. On proton target, compass on proton targets, compass on deuterium, Hermes on the proton. For Sirius function, this is for, for Collins asymmetries and uh, compass the proton for X, Z, and PT dependence. Quite uh, perfect high square of around 0.85 for Collins 0.97 for Sievers. These are all the data for a plus and minus. Quite a lot from Babar for different combinations of produced produced points, unlike charge or like charge, and also PT dependence for Babar and S3. Again, quite appropriate description. The Drillian was described uh, quite uh, satisfactory as PT dependence for star and for compass Drillian for pion induced Drillian. And these are the data that I showed for proton proton ASABN. So now, if we combine all possible all possible mechanisms, then we can describe uh, ASABN for proton proton and describe the data from Brahms at 62 and high on energy and the data from, from star for pi zeros at different intervals so of rapidity also with very good, good high square. So not only we managed to demonstrate that all these asymmetries have very common origin, so that uh, they are due to this intrinsic um, 
multi-partner distributions, but also what we did in our analysis is that we managed to, for the first time, demonstrate that uh, the tensor charge extracted from the extraction is compatible with the uh, lattice computations. So here, uh, to the left, what I show is the contribution to the tensor charge of the nucleon for up and down quark. Okay, so for down quark, it's negative, for up, it's positive. And now if we were to fit on Lycidas data, we would have a lot of uncertainty. So that's the blue blob here. If we added a plus or minus data, now we would shrink, of course, our knowledge, and that's the green blob here. And then after adding proton, proton, we are moving into this red blob here. Okay, in this red blob, there is also the computation from Alessandro et al. 2019 of the tensor charge contributions from Lattice. So our central result is quite compatible with that. So here, this point here is results by Radici and by Keta that uses the extraction of transversity in the channel there. Transversity is not um, coupling to Collins fragmentation function, but to the so-called dihadron interference fragmentation function. So they seem to be a little bit of tension between our result and their result. Their result is also global fit, including proton proton. And so we, we, we intend to check their result and see what's, there is, what's the reason of this discrepancy here. In this plot here, I show the results for GT, which is the isovector tensor charge. It's the difference between the contribution from delta U and delta T. That's, so that's what is important for researchers of beyond model physics. And so the previous uh, phenologist here, starting from Anselmino 2013 to 2020, and our result from CDS would be very large. Uncertainty for CDS and CIA smaller. And here are the final result of this 2020 paper. Again, it is compatible with the lattice, lattice results. So we show that for the first time, we see the compatibility of lattice and phenology for tensor charge, not only for isovector tensor charge, the GT, which is here but also for individual components. And uh, I think this was a very nice uh, paper. So Justin, thank you for being part of it. Um, but also everybody else, of course, that's, that's the, the, this, the, those are the people from, uh, from, from JAM collaboration who participated in, in, this, particular, in this particular research. So now before uh, we adjourn and then we, uh, when we start talking about my, my Mathematica package, um, let me just uh, remind you that it's, it's extremely important to keep in mind that uh, in order to get phenological knowledge of distributions, one have to uh, use a variety of processes, not only same inclusive deep elastic process as of course we uh, wish to, uh, Jefferson's lab or, 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 electron, or the electron ion collider, but also drill ion measurements are very important. And the plus and minus angulation uh, measurements are very important as well because they give us insights on, on the uh, fragmentation and also hard on hard collisions. Uh, they, of course, are more entangled. There are more ingredients sitting there, but they all uh, related. So only the combination of all those can give us uh, good good results as, as we can see maybe also from here because after we included uh, CDS e plus and minus and proton proton we were able actually to to show compatibility of phenology and and lattice so now the last few minutes I wanted to speak about why TMDs factorization and evolution and then go into my into my mathematical notebooks, I think it's a very good point to stop for five minutes or so and, and reconvene. So are there any questions so far? Hello. Uh, I have a question. Um, yeah, earlier, go ahead. Earlier you mentioned um, the right relationship between the GPDD and the anomalous uh, magnet moment using Sivers functions. Is it yes. possible? 
is it possible to reproduce um, the relationship between the other QPDs and say an angular momentum like pressure or shear using the same method, or is it better to use like a angular momentum something like that? Um, it's so the 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 the, the, the relationships that you're talking about uh, about the mechanical properties of the nucleon and particular and particular GPDs are more fundamental. So indeed, if one if one takes uh, uh, this approach that was done by 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 by, by the late Maxim Polikov, then those relationships between the mechanical properties and GPDs uh, stay on on a very fundamental level. So what 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 I mean here is. Uh, I don't think I had any more explanation of this relationship, but there's just, yeah. So, so here, Sears function was related to GPDs in a way that um, um, that, that that if 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 there is a quark pol if there is a nuclear polarization, then GP there is also spin dependent GPDs that tell us that the quarks should be also shifted towards different positions in the position space. Now, what, what Matthias did is that he related this. So he said, okay, the, what's happening is that my my quark in the moment in, in the position space is shifted. It is it is it is hit by 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 a photon. And now it has to leave the core or the, the nucleon. But once it's leaving the nucleon, it experiences the interaction between the remnant and the remnant is more or less where the nucleon center of mass is. And so it pulls it. And so the and so the quark, once it's leaving, it bends in one direction. So now the, the same sort of explanation of rotation. And once it's rotating, when it goes towards you or towards the, uh, the virtual photon, virtual photon sees it more. So that's why the shift is happening. And so and and so the bending is happening predominantly in one in one direction. So that's that's a very intuitive physical interpretation, right? But Matthias made another step and he said, well, now let us relate it to serious function, which is team D. But unfortunately, there is no relations between GPDs and TMDs, which are not model inspired. So now physically, physically, that's all true. That's okay. But uh, in terms of uh, doing it, uh, doing it uh, rigorously, um, this relationship is semi-classical at, at, at its best. It, it, it shouldn't be probably used in, uh, in phenological extractions. It's not at the same level as what, as what you mentioned. What you mentioned is, is, is pretty, 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 pretty rigorous. So now can, can, can there be such relations in practice? In practice, maybe yes, because in practice also some model, models describe you know, structure of nuclear quite well. Uh, well, because probably models capture most of the dynamics, even though they don't have the whole dynamics, but they capture dynamics well. And therefore maybe in practice, in, we have these relations, but they're not, they're not fundamental from the point of view of you know, rigorous Technological or theoretical uh, durations. Any other questions now? All right. Yeah, let's. I think we should go on. Now, let five minutes and then we convene with Mathematica and the last few slides for me. All right, let's stretch for a few minutes. Of the cross sections and uh, general and, uh, and and general structures in the uh, in the description. However, of course, uh, uh, the team uh, the evolution is an incredibly interesting aspect of logical work. Well, study of evolution, of course, gives us insight on different aspects of the. An origin of confined motion of partners and gluons, and uh, if we speak about the confined motion, then we we, we have the, the intrinsic, say, transverse motion of quarks inside of the inside of the nucleon. Then 
then once the uh, quarks propagate, they start showering, and this gluon shower aspects, uh, of course, are very important as well. There are different ways of gluons to communicate with, with quarks. Um, and uh, and and uh, last but not least, of course, we, we, we speak about the emergence of hadrons in, in, in hadronization, which is for, for, for many of us practitioners of, of QCD is the ultimate frontier of QCD. Understand, you know, how from, from quarks we get, we get hadrons in, in details. And steam devolution has also a universal non perturbative part. And you heard about this in, in many talks. And it's even goes beyond, goes beyond the usual team defactorization. And the results of evolution as such cannot be uniquely predicted uh, using just evolution equations until the non perturbative part is reliably extracted from the data. This non perturbative part, which is related to soft factor or whole and software kernel. Uh, uh, is related to very intrinsically to the properties of the uh, vacuum of QCD. And that's that's a very in interesting aspect of, of our studies. We, we are understanding you know, some details of confinement, if you like. And uh, those things can be also tested in lattice computations. So you, you've seen many times already, I believe this week, how uh, team defactorization and uh, evolution is introduced, but let's just skim and see, you know, the um, phenological aspects. So in order to, uh, to, 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 to do the factorization properly, one need to take, uh, say, higher order diagrams, such as this one, I mean, gluon interaction here, and factorize in different regions. So the gluon going, uh, say, collinear to one hadron or the other hadron, soft region for, for the radiation and hard region. And by doing so, we get this to this picture there. We have uh, gluons, hard gluons sitting in these blobs here for hard processes. Collinear gluons then would produce uh, these lines and would be embedded in our TMDs. And this very interesting soft factor will emerge as well. So the soft factor can be partitioned between these distributions in a particular way. And there is a way to do this such that uh, now we are talking about just two TMDs and hard, hard, hard factors. So just like collinear PDFs, TMDs, of course, also depend on the scale for collinear PDFs, of course, the DGLAP evolution can be also seen as a resummation. They resum the single logarithms of Q squared over mu squared. And the kernel, what's interesting, is perturbative, purely perturbative. If we start from initial scale, which is perturbative, and we go to the final scale, our kernel will depend on these two scales, and it can be calculated perturbatively. So now, uh, results of the evolution are, of course, um, unique, and they can be predicted by, by the evolution equations. For TMDs, we have this additional scale, k perp, which introduces additional logarithms. And this famous double logarithms log squared of q squared over k perp squared. They also have to be resumed. They're related to particular aspects of, uh, of, of rapidity and divergences. And, but the kernel, what's interesting, is, of course, non-perturbative, because our k perp can be a order of lambda qsd. This gives. This gives a, it's an interesting um, aspect of, 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 of QCD, where we are studying QCD in a very deep non perturbative regime. Now, if we want to evolve our TMD from one scale to the other scale, our evolution kernel will also have this non perturbative part of it. And therefore, we will need to understand it before we can do it unambiguously. And so, of course, the, the way how to do it, how to do this integral from zero to infinity in the, in the Fourier transform is to refactorize the results, maybe in the longitudinal and collinear parts, do the operator product expansion at low values of the momentum B. There we relate, say, our team, team Ds to collinear distributions. Then we have quote unquote transverse part, which contain the so-called pseudo form factor. And the pseudo form factor is very, um, ubiquitous object in many, in many fields. And we have the non-perturbative 
part of the evolution. So this non-perturbative part of the evolution or non-perturbative part of the sort of form factor is extremely important because it tells us about the properties of the vacuum of QCD. And the key ingredient uh, is spin independent. Uh, therefore, we can combine everything and do a resummation up to higher orders and do this well. Um, of course, phenologically, Fourier transform here, operate product expansion here, calculations of these integrals here, they are all slow, they have to be speed up in different ways, or the one can one should find some 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 good ways to relate to do this without without Fourier transforms, do the resummation directly in KT space. That's 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 what Chris actually proposed. So this helps phenology, of course, from the point of view of um, computational performances, but it also gives us a lot of insights on different important aspects here. And uh, last but not least, the, uh, there is validity region of the team defactorization to some particular region in PT. Apart from this, we need to relate it to collinear counterpart, collinear calculations. <coughs> Excuse me, and that's, that's why this Y term is is introduced. So why from uh, corrects our team D cross section in such a way that point per point we describe it very well. So ultimately, the goal of say team D collaboration phenology is to describe all this spectra point per point with controllable approximation with errors, combining team D and collinear descriptions. And that's that's the goal of our of our analysis. And there is very fast progress on that. Uh, I haven't spoken about this in, in my lectures, but uh, in the future you'll hear a lot about this. And there are a lot of new results and new groups formed throughout the world. And also thanks to team D collaboration, we have many uh, phenological analysis started and going on. Um, so this brings me to the end of my part then then I show you my slides so you're welcome to ask any questions in the meantime but let me start with my mathematical presentation so are there any questions about this very short introduction to TMD evolution what is happening in, in phenology on that. Duff, what's hmm. the smallest Q squared that you can actually do TMD factorization at? You mean phenologically? Phenomenologically, phenomenologically. So. Or, or, or do you not have enough data to actually answer that question? No, no, no. Well, it's it's it, it's a it's a very good question. So what 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 we did phenologically is um, we 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 took all data from Hermes and, and Compass, and at Hermes they go as low as one point three GV in Q in Q. So and it 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 turns out that uh, the the simplest say. Parton model analysis works even better for 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 for, for lower Q squares. We're quite un understandably because you can argue that you don't have to take shower into analysis at all and describe just by some non-perturbative functions. It's the combination of non-perturbative and, uh, and and resumation that that's troublesome. But uh, as far as, as as we saw so far, uh, you know. Up, up to up to one one GB, it, it, it works. Now, other problems? Yes, yes, there are. Maybe they are related to to the fact that there are our corrections, which should be quite large in this regime. But phenologically, it looked like it worked quite well. Okay. Right. So the last twenty five minutes, let me introduce uh, the examples and let me introduce the uh, homework. So here's the notebook. Uh, it's called 
example.mb, that's just introducing the package. So let me evaluate it. So what this notebook is doing, it's reading the package, which is called www.cds.m, which was written by myself and a PhD student from University of Connecticut, who is now is a postdoc at JLab, I believe, uh, came out as Dean. This gives you all functions that are present there. So if you clicked on any functions, so for instance, F1U, it tells you is unpolarized collinear PDF of upquark taken from here. If you click, say, on this one, it will tell you is the double spin asymmetry on, for instance, this AUT, the Collins asymmetry. <clears throat> And it tells you what these distributions are. One can plot the collinear distributions that look like this, for instance. And one can plot this asymmetries that I would like you guys to, to reproduce. It's AUT series. It's just take the pi and x, z, q squared, and pt is the series asymmetry AUT sine phi h minus phi s. And that's, I take my x Birkins, z q squared pt, plot this function for pi plus and pi minus, and I have this pi plus there and pi minus there, okay? So for pi minus, it's very low, compatible with zero, for pi, pi plus is large. For Collins asymmetry, AUT Collins, it's the AUT sine phi h plus phi s. Again, I plot for pi plus and pi minus, for pi plus it's positive, for pi minus is negative, these are, this is the result, okay, from phenology. So this just introduces this this, this package that contains all, 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 all these functions and, and, and asymmetries. So what I'd like us to do is to actually understand a little bit more how we calculate it actually and what's, 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 what's there inside. So let me, in order to do that, let me open so example, I don't need example anymore. Don't save. And share screen. Yes, let me open this file, which is called A. It, it looks like all solution, but it's not all solution. It's ALL solution. So it's exercise zero, which is ALL asymmetry, same inclusive diplomacy scattering, okay? So let us start evaluating this and then I'll tell you, let me make it bigger. 50%, make it full screen, so we can go step by step, okay? So this only sets the notebook directory. This reads the package as is in previous. Okay, so this one will tell you again what, what, what functions are present in the, in the package. So clicking on any of them, you get information. So right now, let me go and talk about this particular one. So it's definition, structure functions, and convolutions. So this is intended to teach you how to do the actual analytical computations. So first, what I do is that I define uh, my vectors that I need or how I would like them to, to be seen. PHT, it's PHT, the transformation of produced pattern, KT, PT, F1, H1, and so on and so forth. Here already I take assumptions such that when we, then I do the integration, mathematics doesn't produce me a lot of nonsense. Here are the moments. Okay, so there's moments, uh, let's see, can do that. So it's 21, 22, 23, yeah, so I evaluated this. So those moments are those created KT moments that are related in a way to twist-free functions and I need them for my computations. So it's the moment of TMD. Okay, so it's the end moment. And what I call the Z moment of TMD is the moment of the fragmentation function. So for the fragmentation function, I need this z squared sitting there. So then I define convolutions as uh, defined by, by, by paper, by get it all. And then I define it, 
the convolution in a way as we do in the in the TMD handbook. So now the equations in this particular notebooks are related to a particular paper that uh, that we wrote with uh, Kemal and others, and this paper is uh, also present in the uh, subfolder lectures. Okay, so I just then I plot this. It's you can find it in the no in the TMD handbook, but also in this in this paper. So I define the convolution of TMDs with TMD F and fragmentation on TMD D, and I can introduce some weight. This omega is the weight. Okay. Then next, what I do is that I actually introduce distribution and fragmentation functions explicitly. So F1, D1, unpolarized distribution, unpolarized fragmentation. So F1 here is intended to be uh, the collinear distribution. And this is the KT dependence, which I take to be Gaussian. So it's done for illustration properties, but it's also used in phenomenology. So here, the nice thing is that you can always do the integration analytically, either by hand or, or using Mathematica or other methods. So all functions that we need are uh, introduced here. Now here I say, let us check those, uh, those, those distributions. So for instance, I say F1 is equal, and I say it's just the X moment of TMD, zero F1. So I don't integrate it with anything and it says, this is just F1. So that's what I, that's what I want to have. So the first moment of uh, unpolarized TMD looks to be like this and this particular approximation. Uh, the same was done for the unpolarized fragmentation functions. Now I did the same, I think for what uh, it's for H1, for, um, for HL. And sorry, it's taken from a longer notebook. So what's important here is for Sievers, for instance. If I take the first moment of Sievers function, I say X moment TMD1 of F1 T perp, I get F1 perp, so the first moment. So what, what we did here is, we, as we did in the analysis with um, Justin Kamarot and others, we parameterize Sievers function, for instance, F1 T perp in terms of the first moment, okay? And with some Gauss independence. So at any point, then, 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 then you do this, you can, you can actually ask what, what, what those functions are. So here you can write question mark and say F1 T, oops, sorry, F1 T perp. Okay, so it's, it's, what's, the, what's the function, right? And it says F1 T perp is the function that is parameterized by F1 first perp. This was my clumsy way of writing. This is the first moment of series function times this Gaussian dependence. This is how it should depend on the uh, intrinsic moment. So now I'm saying here omegas from equation 2.19, again, referring to this paper with uh, Saman, Bastami and others. So those are nothing but uh, the weights that I encounter it in, uh, in the convolutions. So you can find them also in the, um, in the uh, TMD handbook. So sometimes you just do, let me, let me probably quickly stop sharing here and, and open the TMD handbook so that you can see where you can, where you can find them so, so that you have idea of what those are. So, so for us who don't have a, like a recent 
mathematic activation key on deck. Um, do you have packages available in, in Python for that exercise that we can import, or, or are we just going to be kind of writing those ones from scratch a little bit? Um, I don't have a dedicated package which is available through GitHub or anything. So I actually intend to rewrite this package in, in Python, but I haven't. And so this is exercise number three. Um, so you, you mean you don't have any access to, to, any, um, to any Mathematica? I, I probably just have to dig through my emails to find the activation key. So ah, just, okay. Straight to the Python instead. Right, know. right. Like, Send, 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 send me a message and we can chat about this, okay? So I'll probably try to, to, to help, uh, so to facilitate somehow. So uh, unfortunately, I, I did write this in um, proprietary language in Mathematica and it's probably not the, um, the, 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 the best thing to do, but this is how it was. It was done. So in Python, uh, we have uh, our analysis framework for for Jam, but it's so humongous that probably to, it will be very difficult to navigate if I were to to give access for students to it. So I would I would probably refrain refrain from doing this. So okay. So I wanted to find in the in the notebook something here in our text. So let me go to chapter two and go here to polarized drill yarn Higgs polarized series cross section. Here we go. So polarized Higgs cross section is here. That's the leading twist part. And here are the convolutions. Okay, in the convolutions you have say F1, D1, but you also have h1 perp h1 perp here with this prefactor and this is what i call omega okay so that's where you can find those or also take just my paper and uh, in the in the notebook i refer to the paper but also you can have the you can have all those here so these omegas are here so omega three for instance that, that you saw just before Okay, and I, I just did 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 did, did uh, something that you could have done, but I, I wrote them in terms of these vectors explicitly, kt and pht, which go into the uh, into the uh, convolutions. Okay, so now let's go into this cell here, and that's the FUU analytical result. Okay, so what I'm doing here is that I'm asking. So what's F1, what's D1? So F1 is my unpolarized uh, distribution, D1 is unpolarized uh, fragmentation, and, and omega zero is just one, okay? So that's because I need to do omega zero F1, D1. So one F1, D1 here. And then let's try to do this integration. So what I'm asking mathematics is to do the convolution. Oh, really? And it tells me this. So it's probably I didn't evaluate, evaluate this part. This. Okay. So what I'm asking it is to perform this convolution I'm sorry for my hectic browsing from my own notebook. Here we go. I'm trying to do this convolution here. This convolution here is just the convolution that we perform with TMD functions. I took already the delta function explicitly. So in this D function, I have the results after, after, after the delta function, delta two function. Okay, and then I'm integrating in angle phi and kt of the uh, of one one remaining integration. So I 
integrate in this pperp using this delta function, plug in the result here explicitly, it's done already. Now omega should be written in terms of the remaining variables, which is phi, kt, and pht, and that's what I did in, in the previous step. And now let's evaluate these guys here. Yeah. Let's ask here. So, okay. Let's see if we have more luck here. Okay, so what now it does, it, it's evaluating this integral f1, d1. Okay, while it's doing so, let me just go on the next step. Once I have this result, I go ahead and, and program this result explicitly. So it'll take it a little bit of time. So let me go and show where the result is, is programmed. So the, uh, the result was like this. So it's F1, D1 times a particular um, Gaussian function. So the Gaussian function looks like this here. And then what I do is that I'm using results uh, from the previous cell, which I hope will appear soon. I plug in this value of the average momentum from the uh, from the package, which is unpolarized, average momentum of unpolarized D1. And here is the average momentum, uh, transfer momentum width of unpolarized F1. Okay, and then I'm just plugging in all the sum of the charges plugging them directly like four over nine for up quark times F1u times D1u of X and Z and times the exponential. So right now what I did here is, oh, here we go. So this is the, this is the result of this convolution. So it tells me that is D1 times F1 times the exponential of minus PHT squared. PHT again is the uh, transverse momentum of the produced hadron squared divided by this combination of the widths of the TMD F1, which is KTA, and the fragmentation function D1, which is PTA, okay? So then again, you can, you can ask what PTA is, I believe. Oh, it's missing, interesting. Okay, so PTA is, oh, doesn't want to, 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 to tell me this. It's, sorry, ABP, that's how we call it. It's the unpolarized D1 bits, so average for the D1. So this is the combination that goes in with Z1. Okay, and so now I do it here for numerics, I plug in the combination of uh, F1, D1, F1, D, D1, D. Again, for each one, you can check check what's, what, what package tells you this thing is. So it's just the sum. So I assumed also that this uh, widths are independent of X and Z, so I can take it out as such. And then I can plot plot my result here. It's FUU as a function of PHT. And now I'm asking myself, what is the analytical result for FLL? Okay, so FLL again is the convolution of omega zero. See the, the paper G1, D1. G1 is the helicity TMD. Okay, so then again, I'm doing this. And it says variety ex expression here. In the, in every notebook, it would tell you variety expression here, and there will be nothing there for series and coordinates. So I'd like you to write your expression and evaluate it. But it will give you what to use. So I'll I'll show in a second um, also some of the other series of coordinates so that you you have you have you have the sense what is happening. So that I'm just saying convolution of omega zero g one and d one. And then while it's evaluating, let me go to this to this cell here for numerics. And again, it tells me you have to perform this. 
have to this, do this um, sum, g1 u, d1, g1 d, d1 here, we have this particular Gaussian where lambda is this, and that's what I'm using here. So AVP is the width of unpolarized D1. If AVKG here is the width of the Helicity distribution G1 here. So it's AVKG, Helicity G1 in D width. Okay, so then it's, it's then put in this exponential form. So let's see if it's still running. No, it's not running, it's done. So here it gives me the result. Okay, and I'm just programming it directly. So while once, once I've done it, okay, I can plot now my FUU and FLL, and then I can do my numerics. Okay, so that's I'm doing my ALL test, which is a FLL test. That's one that I programmed and FUU test, the ratio. Now I can plot what is done with functions from w, WWC this package. And then it shows me pi plus is like this, pi minus is like that. And then my test functions actually give me the same results. Well, no surprise actually, I, I knew what to do obviously. But uh, now let me show say Sears notebook and then Probably this will be more obvious for you what's, what to do. Okay, there you go. So Sirius is, 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 is an example of, of the homework that, that I'd like you to do. Okay, so it says exercise one, Sirius AUT phi H minus phi S. Then it starts from the same things. It introduces this package. Here are all the functions. It gives the same definitions that has the convolution already in the same omegas. Again, these are from the paper, not from Team D handbook. My apologies, but you, you have them all the same in the Team D handbook as well. And then it has FU analytical result. And I've done it for you. I showed you just the results, convolution, result, and numerics how to program it, okay? So this gives you an idea where to get all the functions that you need. Now for FUT sine phi H minus phi S, I tell you this is the convolution. So it's C minus omega B1 F1T perp D1. So omega B1, go ahead and find it in the, in the cell with these omegas. Okay, so here's omega B1. And now I'm telling you this, you need to combine with F1 tperp. And the symbol F1 tperp is just my series function and D1. So you need to write your expression here as done in other examples and find what is happening for series function. So now this expression is not, is not written. So it's for you to write. So once you find out what the result is, it tells you now do the numerics. And it also gives you hints. Use AVP, AVKS, which is the width of the series function. Use first moment of series function and gives you how to use this first moment. For up, down, and so on and so forth, use D1U, D1D, and so on and so forth. So once you have this expression, you can go ahead and write it. Even more so here, this function, this, this equation 5.7 is actually the result of this computation. So you should, you should be able to get it on the previous step, okay? So, but once you get it, you compare it to this one and then program it here. After you have programmed it, you can do numerics. So you define your test functions. So this will be writing in Mathematica. And then here's, the result from the package. And here there will be results from your calculation and they should coincide. And this is what I think everybody who has access to Mathematica um, should be able to reproduce. It will 
teach you uh, more or less how to do these computations in Mathematica uh, effectively. Now, if you want to do something which is more related to, 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 to physical research, uh, you know, in technology in, in our field, try to do not only this exercise, but try to show actually that uh, the formulas, the Fourier transforms from the handbook. And sorry, I think I'm going over time, but it will take me only five minutes, no more than that. Try to take the team the book now and you see these are complicated formulas and so that's what you learn how to deal with using this mathematical notebook but there are these beautiful formulas with Bessel transforms which are much simpler only that they contain Fourier transformed team Ds. And so what I'd like you to try is to show that these beautiful formulas work with Fourier transforms, transform team Ds. Take the definition of Fourier transforms of team Ds, Fourier transform them, plug these formulas in, in the Bessel transform like this, and show that they all give the same results in the model that we use in this particular notebook. So it will tell you that this formulas for Bessel transforms here and this for calculation of, of structure functions are exactly the same. So there is no magic happening. So and you'll do it numerically. Oh, so you'll do it analytically at, at this point. You can prove it actually uh, with full glory just mathematically writing on, on a piece of paper. But I'd like you to do it in this way because then it will teach you how to use this package and, and, and do the plots. And of course, if, if anybody wants to try to write any part of this in, in Python or use symbolic um, Python for computations, analytical computations, that will be really great. And I'll be really very keen on collaborating with any of you who undertake this sort of um, continuation of research. Yeah, with that, uh, Chris, I think I'm done. So I hope uh, it was clear what I'd like uh, students to do. Uh, don't hesitate to ask me any questions. And in particular, if you don't have access to Mathematica, please communicate with me. I'll try to think some plausible solutions. So maybe we can run it from, from one of our servers, I, I, I should think. But I hope if you have access to Mathematica, try to run these notebooks and see if you can have um, at least some of these exercises done. And let me know how it goes. Thank you, Alexi. Final questions for uh, our speaker? Everybody ready for dinner? <laughs> I think everybody's ready for, uh, for 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 doing the exercises, right? Sure. I don't see any questions here. Or All right. So if, if you think of any of, of questions or um, just let me know and I'll I'll come back to you. Alexei, I want to thank you again very much for doing this on short notice on your son's birthday. <laughs> I think I sent a message to you. This is you win the award for the highest level of preparation in comparison to the amount of time we gave you. Oh, I had I had a lot of time. Twenty four hours is more than enough <laughs> for you. You're an inspiration. So. Thank you, Chris. This was a pleasure. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Everybody here and on Zoom, we'll see you. Uh,